Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. I am David Farkas. I'm joined as always by Josh Lair. Hey everybody. And over there producing the show, we've got Jose Rivera. Hello, hello. We also have a special guest in the studio tonight, Lorena. Who doesn't have her own camera, but, but she's here. But she can probably say hello. <laughs> or or make that. an appearance on Jose's camera. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, don't don't make her feel bad. Yeah, she's fine. fine. She's like stuck in the corner over there. Anyway, she's helping with uh, with the questions tonight. So Absolutely. thanks, Lauren. Since we have so many questions, because what kind of episode is this? Well, if you've watched the show over the last few years, you probably realize that about every ten or so episodes, we do an Ask Us Anything. Mm -hmm. This happens to be episode sixty three. So we're, we we got sidetracked by a couple of major product well, we releases. Had, because we had the Q3, the one the 400, the monochrome, the monochrome. Yeah, right. but today is, or tonight is all about Ask Us Anything. Mm -hmm. So essentially what this allows everyone to do is all the burning like questions you've been saving up, you fire them at us and we will do our best to address as many as we can. Or our worst. Somewhere in between. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, somewhere in between our best and our worst, you yeah. will absolutely Hopefully get all of it. Slightly towards our best. Yeah. Now, we've already have, um, received almost 40 or 50 questions, so we'll try to get mm -hmm. to those first. Mm -hmm. uh, Lorena and Jose will be monitoring the chat, so we'll try to answer questions in the chat as well. Exactly. So don't hesitate to drop a question uh, as we're going, because uh, we're going to put all those questions together, and uh, they will uh, feed us all the good things, so we don't have to be staring at the screen. Yes, we've got yes, we've um, got the production crew here. I feel like we should lay out a couple ground rules first about how to how we handle these things. Uh, but for no, me or for them? For them. Okay. <laughs> for okay, you, okay. you just no. It's fine. <laughs> I got you under control. Um, first is the title of the show is "Ask Us Anything." It is not "We Answer Anything." So keep that in mind. There are some questions we will not be able to answer. We won't have time to answer, or simply don't make sense for us to answer on air. Doesn't mean. We can't address them one-on-one -on -one if you reach sure. out to us, but we cannot answer everything. Number two, there are certain questions that if you watch the show enough, you know we simply do not answer. Um, those are going to be questions basically related to two things. One is the future. So a future like a product, service, firmware update, feature, anything like that, you know, what may like a do, we don't know, so we can't answer that. The crystal ball is out of order. Yes. yes. We would love to know, but uh, we are, we don't. Yeah. Um, and the second one is generally about like products that we don't necessarily have in stock yet. Mm. You know, when can we get them? We generally don't know. We'll try to address that with at least some, at some point, but specific questions like when can I get my XYZ product? We don't know. Yeah. Um, I promise there are things we do know. <laughs> Thank you. Do we? I mean, kind of. Yeah. And, um, one plus one equals something. So something. why don't we get, get started? To it. Let's get to it. Um, Jose can be our question asker, right. so fire away. <laughs> Let's see. Um, can Leica lenses released until 2018 be used with mod modern Leica cameras, especially since the sensor is 60 megapixel? Good question for you. Yes. <laughs> I mean... Okay, great. <laughs> Next. Look, I, when Leica releases, and I'm just going to grab what's right in front of me. But when Leica releases a lens like this, right? This is a, a reissue. This is the 35 1.4 steel rim, although it's not a steel rim, but it is a steel rim. Why would they release this lens last year in, in 2022 when there are 60 megapixel cameras out there, right? Clearly Leica understands what they're doing and they're not releasing lenses just like that over there, which is, you know, 35 Apple SL, 
or let's say 35 apo m here somewhere here, here. somewhere um, that can resolve every single last pixel wide open because I think they realize that there are different kind of Leica photographers. Some people are looking for the absolute, you know, nth degree of quality, that last marginal percent, ever so slightly better than whatever came before it and other lenses, and just want the absolute pinnacle of performance, no compromise. And there's lenses for that. Yeah. 35 Apo M. Yeah. Or 35 Apo SL. Any of the SL Apo Primes. Any of the Apo SL Primes. Yeah. Right? We have that. But Leica also realizes a lot of people like to use vintage lenses. Mm -hmm. And because the M mount was developed in 1954, we have access to a whole back catalog. The reason for the Classics line, just as an example, is because finding a, a sample like, you know, not hazy, not cloudy, uh, not scratched up because of cleaning over 50 years of use. Now you can get a new one that has that same vintage look so you can kind of explore your creativity, right? You can have the sharpest and you can have the look lenses. You can have that that old Leica character from the 1950s, 1960s uh, on your camera. So I, I guess I'm... Have I actually answered the question or have I well, worked around it? Well, the short it? answer was yes, which you said. The yeah. longer answer is not every Leica lens is designed around maximum performance. Mm -hmm. The amount of megapixels that are behind it are really not that related to what the lens is going to give you. You're going to get a larger file that's more editable, croppable, whatever, but it's not really much of a detriment to using, let's say, a 1980s lens on 20, 40, or 60 megapixels. The resulting image and the feel and the look is going to be the same, factoring out the uniqueness of the sensor. I mean, I've even heard, you know, in some of these conversations with Leica, they feel that higher megapixel actually ex exposes more of the character of the vintage lenses even than the lower megapixels because it captures that subtle nuance and everything. You know, you're throwing away nothing. Yeah. And and actually bringing new light, because no matter what film you shot, you could never have gotten 60 megapixels worth of equivalent resolution. Right. So it is breathing new life into these old lenses. For sure. Um, whether you're going all the way back, you know, to the, the super classic vintage stuff, or like Josh said, to yeah. the 80s and 90s. And I'll, I'll, I'll close it on this. The great irony is I think vintage lenses do better now with live view oh my than gosh, they yes. ever did yes. with the rangefinder. Yes. So you actually, are, I think, are getting better performance <laughs> from vintage lenses on a 60 megapixel camera than you got on film That's true. in terms of practical use because you're able to nail the focus that much more consistently. Yeah, especially lenses that historically aren't um, very easy to see if they're sharp or not wide open. Yeah. Right. Next question. Yeah. That was good. That was, yeah. Yeah. We're getting started. All right. If I want to check the quality of an older Leica lens myself, what are the best steps as a non-professional for me to take into doing this? What should I look for? What is the proper way to fully test them? Sure. That's something I do all the time. So when you're looking at buying any Leica lens, whether it's vintage, semi-vintage, or new, there are a couple things you want to look for. The first one is obvious, which is rangefinder calibration. And the way that I do that is I have a calibrated, in my case, M11, meaning it's an M11 that I know is working properly with lenses. It's got a VisaFlex on it. So when I attach a lens, I will focus with the rangefinder without moving the camera. I'll either have it on a tripod or I'll just hold it steady. And I'll move my eye from the rangefinder once it's in focus to the VisaFlex magnified. And I'll see, is it actually in focus or not? And I'm essentially using the live view to cross-reference to make sure the rangefinder calibration is spot on. That's the first thing that I'll do. Second thing is I'll check the feel of the focus ring. Is it smooth? Is it linear? Does it have sticky spots? Does it get stuck at infinity or at minimum? Is there any grinding? I check the aperture ring to make sure it has firm detents to make sure it's not flopping around. I make sure the barrel isn't loose. And then the last thing I'll do is put the lens up to a light source and look for dust haze. There's gonna be dust no matter what. I'm looking for something that's significant. So a significant amount of dust, haze, fungus, cleaning marks, uh, anything that would require a CLA is something I'm gonna be looking for. Although some things like cleaning marks can't necessarily be fixed. Correct, but it's going to affect the value. So, you know, you may get a great deal on a lens with cleaning marks and they may only have a nominal impact on the lens's performance, but you can save a lot of money buying the lens. So uh, it doesn't mean you have to only buy perfect lenses. It just means you want to know what you're getting to make sure you're paying a fair price for it. I think that's reasonable. Okay. Yeah. Next. Okay. 
I have an M3 and would like to be able to use 28mm and 35mm lenses with a reasonably accurate framing. Um, what is the most efficient means to do this? Well, if you're, if you're, I'll grab this one. Yeah, yeah go for it. Um, yeah, sure. um, if you're using a 35, you have the option to get a 35 that has the goggles on it. So a vintage 35, Sumicron, Sumeron, Sumalux. They made versions of those lenses that have a integrated goggle attachment that augments the rangefinder window to allow you to compose with 35. The other option, especially with specifically for 28 Sorry, and wider, yeah. is to get one of these. Um, you can put it in. Do we have the close-up or we can yeah, put it down here? Yeah. This is... Nope, higher. So this. There you go. Here we go. This is a 21, 24, 28 uh, Leica viewfinder. These are really cool, and this is going to give you really precise framing for uh, 21, 24, or 28 millimeter lenses. There we go. Sorry. It has like a little zoom. It's uh, very cool. This is actually one we have for sale pre-owned on our website if you want to oh, learn more do? about it. Yeah, oh, that's cool. where I grabbed it from. Um, this goes onto the hot shoe. So this will allow you, even with a, well, this with any rangefinder, because no rangefinder has 24 or 21 frame lines. So if you don't want to use live view, or if you have a camera without live view, meaning analog or pre-M240, a finder like this will allow you to compose precisely. Now, you still have to focus with the rangefinder, which you should do first. So you focus, and then you get your composition dialed in. There you go. Next question. All right. Let's see. For the M11 monochrome, if you set the camera to highlight weighted metering, mm -hmm. uh, why would you also need to underexpose with exposure compensation? Compensation uh, oh, function. That, that is a great question, yep. and one that I continually ask myself <laughs> and people at Leica. Uh, it's highlight weighted. It's not absolute highlight. So I think I even wrote this in my M11 re monochrome review, which is I would like to see a menu option added to not just the M11 monochrome, but to the SL2, SL2S, uh, Q3, Q2, any camera that has highlight weighted metering, I think should have a sensitivity or an aggressiveness or some kind of setting that says, okay, if it's seeing everything and capturing every pixel on that image, in, at least in the preview image, it can know if there is a single pixel that is blown out. Mm. So make a setting that says, okay, no single pixel in this entire image when we've applied our highlight weighted metering will be blown out. And that would be, you know, level 100. I think where we're kind of at right now is somewhere around like 50 to 65% of 100 because it's still, it favors highlights, but it still doesn't want to give you absolute black shadows. So it's kind of trying to split the difference. And I think for most scenarios, it's good. And then there's scenarios where I really wish it would just really look at those highlights and say, nope, nope, yeah. everything's going dark after this. Um, and having that user adjustable would be fantastic. Uh, I have made that suggestion, whether like as listening to that. But hey. It's a good question though. But yeah, I mean. And a good answer. Yeah, we, we face the exact same thing. It's not perfect. So don't just set it, forget it, and trust it. You know, make sure you look at your image, make sure you're spot checking your images as you're shooting. That's one of the great things about digital is that you can actually see your results as you're going. I know it's it's easy to get caught in the moment, but always, you know, take a look, see what you got, mm -hmm. and then, whoa, these are running half a stop right. Let me tone it down and then hmm. keep shooting. All right. Um, All right. Or if you're shooting in live view. You got to go to the next question. This one is related. What you so <laughs> go. This one's related. So let's, That's, the, it's near and dear to my heart. I know, that I know. One. We, gotta, we got a lot of questions. Dear. With the M10R, to avoid blowing highlights, is it best to use full metering or center weighted on the brightest area? What is your best practice? I mean, the, that's the same. Yeah, the M10R doesn't have highlight weighted metering yeah. because no. it's a mechanical shutter camera. But, um, with but I, I mean, counterintuitively, and I think we covered this in our M episode. Yeah. Uh, personally, I prefer just traditional classic metering mm -hmm. over the advanced metering. Uh, I, I think it's pretty accurate. The classic metering takes a two-thirds of the image sort of weighted to the middle and then a little bit less in the outer perimeter. Uh, and that's the classic center-weighted metering. And it works yeah. for it, most everything. Exposure compensation is your friend yeah. on a camera like the M10R, or really any of the cameras that don't have the highlight-weighted metering. Well, and we should reiterate, um, whether it's M11, monochrome, whether it's M10R, these cameras don't have a lot of highlight leeway, which is why this highlight weighted metering exists, mm -hmm. or even the methodology to make sure that you're not blowing your highlights by using, uh, you know, exposure warning. 
Um, but uh, they have tons of information in the shadows. So you're able to pull up shadows on an M10R three to four stops uh, at lower ISO, and you'll never see any noise. So always err on the side of underexposure if given the opportunity. Next question. Okay. I have a Leica CL camera with six lenses. With the end of production of the CL camera, what other cameras best utilizes these lenses? What do you think, lenses? Josh? It's a good question. Yeah. So the CL lenses or the TL lenses are L-mount. So they'll work on any Leica L-mount camera. Mm -hmm. That includes the T701, TL, TL2, CL, S, uh, excuse me, SL, uh, Type 601, SL2, SL2S. On the SL cameras, they crop the sensor into APS-C mode, so you're losing about half of your resolution, but you retain autofocus and electronic aperture control. David and I routinely use uh, CL or TL lenses on the SLs. In fact, our overhead camera, which you can't see, <laughs> yeah. is a 55 to 135 TL lens on an SL2S. Yeah, take here, why don't you show them a TL lens from a yeah. TL so lens? If you, yeah, yeah, so this is the 60 macro, which is my favorite. Uh, TL lens at the moment. I use this on the SL2 almost every day for product shots. And you're looking at this lens on another TL lens, which is the 55 to 135. That's our own. Oh, lens. I think you're slightly out of focus plane. There you go. There you go. Sorry. Look how nice that is. Beautiful. So I think if you have a well, CL. Well, actually, put, put that back up for just one second. Okay. And I want to draw some attention here. Okay. So, first of all, I'm pretty sure. So that's a 55 135 up there. And I'm pretty sure we have it set to, what, F8-ish? Mm -hmm. And there's a misnomer that cropped lenses, you know, not shooting full frame right. doesn't result in nice bokeh. Ah. But look at all this nice bokeh oh, down here. Try to, like, have something in the background. And it's not even wide open. I'm doing a bad job, but you get You're it. You're doing a bad job. But it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really pleasing look. Yeah. Even, you know, on these TL lenses, my fav that's Josh's favorite. My yeah. favorite is the 35.14 TL, which is phenomenal. I mean, this lens is so, so good and focuses down to a third of a meter. Absolutely love it. Uh, hidden gem. Yeah. So you can use your CL lenses on any of the SL cameras, and especially on the SL2, which is 47 megapixels full frame, and your APS-C mode is 20 megapixels. That is more than usable for tons of ton, uh, mm -hmm. kinds of photography. So And, and it's image stabilized yes. on the sensor. I have frequently traveled with an SL2 and two or three TL lenses to keep a lightweight kit. So Can I also sort of address the, the obvious choice here? OK. If your CL or TL2 is still working... We'll keep using it, yeah. Just keep <laughs> using it. Yeah. Still a good camera. Right. Like a, a camera we both use. Yeah. Yeah. Leica choosing to not make a new model of it doesn't make the CL any less good. Like, I still have a CL, and I still use it. So. Next, all right, next, one, next question. We have so many. That's why I'm, I know, I'm, I'm like, I know. we got a, a camera momentum here. Go. Is the CL still in stock at any Leica store in the U.S.? I don't think so. I doubt it. I mean, it's important to note that we work for Leica Store Miami, which is a privately owned and independently operated Leica store. So I don't know. We don't know yeah, what, we can't speak what other, other Leica stores or dealers or anyone would have in stock but us. But it's been quite a while since yeah. a new CL. We see them pre-owned from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, but new, mm -hmm. there's probably one somewhere in the world sitting on a shelf. Maybe. I'd be nervous about that because it hasn't been touched for years. Sure. I'd rather get a used one that has at least some, some mileage. We know that it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I doubt it. Next. All right. In a previous video, you mentioned that diffraction occurs when you stop down to F8 or higher on a full-frame digital sensor. However, even with the M11 equipped uh, with a stack sensor, does diffraction st still occur? Yes. Yes. So, well, it's not a stack sensor. Uh, the M11 uses a BSI sensor, backside illuminated. Um, I think stack sensors are just like foveon sensors that have multiple color layers. Uh, physics is still physics. Pixel size is still pixel size. So, uh, yes, you get diffraction at 60 megapixel. Technically, like five, six and a half, like 7.1. You're making everybody nervous saying that. <laughs> Just but saying. you can shoot at f8. It's you okay. can shoot at f8. It's gonna be okay. But I, I wouldn't recommend going past f8 on the M11 or M11 monochrome unless you really, really have to. Um, and on the SL2, yeah, F8, F9, because it's 47 megapixel. As as the pixel density increases, the pixel size just gets smaller. That's the nature of how it works. And the smaller and smaller the pixels get, the earlier you hit diffraction, which makes, you know, lenses that perform really well in the more open apertures all that, all that much more important. There you go. Next question. 
Why does why does yeah noise reduction in Lightroom not work with the with the monochrome? Uh oh, the new algorithms. Yeah, the the traditional traditional noise reduction, just amount and um, sharpness and contrast, that still works. Traditional noise reduction absolutely still works, and it uh, responds extremely well to that. For instance, this the the flip side of hitting diffraction because of small pixels actually is to your benefit with the noise reduction algorithm in Photoshop or Lightroom because with the smaller pixels means the noise is smaller, it's more localized, and the algorithm can work better on it uh, without sacrificing sharpness. So I find I can I can go up to 40, 50 amount in Lightroom on traditional um, noise reduction. I think the question is more geared towards the denoise algorithm in Lightroom that was rolled out as beta and now is part of it, which is uh, AI-based. And I believe it needs color channels in order to analyze the noise patterns. And there is no color channels. There you go. Maybe one day. I mean, it's a new feature, so it makes it. It is a new true. feature. I mean, Lightroom keeps changing, you know, moment by moment here. Yeah. Next question. <clears throat> zone focusing. While I get good results, zone focusing 18 millimeter Super Elmar and 20 millimeter El Merit at one or two meters, I always get much sharper focus by rangefinder focusing. Am I making any mistakes in understanding zone focus? Well, the biggest mistake people make is the scale on the lenses is a film mm. era scale. If you want it to be relevant for digital, cut it in half. That's really how much depth of field you have. So yeah. if you're you know, going from eight feet to infinity, it's really more like 16 to 20 feet to infinity. So uh, that's the challenge of using just zone focusing with digital is you just don't have as much depth of field as the scale. Says. Yeah, and a, good, a good rule of thumb is, let's say you're shooting at F8, look at the five, six scale. Yeah. I that's mean, that's good, yeah. the that's without having to, to recalculate. Yeah. Just imagine your mind, it's one stop less depth yeah. of field. And the reality is, remember, that is depth of field is a perception of sharpness. It's not sharpness as a point of focus. So is it acceptably sharp? Yes. Is it as sharp as you rangefinder focusing it? No. Uh, that's that's just how physics works again, you know? You can't beat physics. You can bend the rules a little bit, but you can't break it. Yeah. All right. Next question. Any hints on perfecting rangefinder focusing? Oh, not the whole episode. I mean, so many, so many things. The, you the, the number one tip is keeping your rangefinder windows clean. So all of the, yeah, um, yeah, sure. here. all of the here, here, yeah, using a lens cloth to keep Show them in the overhead. all these windows clean. This is um, very important. This yeah. is worth it. This is worth, get that, get that teal lens out, out of the way. Yeah. So let me just get it in focus here. There we go. So just keeping this window, this window, and this window clean is a huge, um, what's the worst I'm going to think of? It, it's it's going to significantly improve your in-focus rate uh, if they're smudged up. Um, making sure your lenses are calibrated, you know, using the technique that I talked about earlier, checking your lenses, because you could have the best technique in the world, but if the lens isn't calibrated to the rangefinder, well, it's a moot point. Yeah. Um, and practice. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my number one recommendation. Yes. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know. Jose, do you have a close-up camera on me? or? Okay. I know the overhead's on Josh, but I'm just going to... It's okay. We can, you can still talk about Let's it. Let's see. Okay. So I want to talk about this, which is the focus tab on a lot of Leica lenses right now. Okay. Oh, perfect. There we go. So the focus tab on a lot of Leica lenses right there. Now, if you put it in the middle, you will notice this one is set to, I don't know, about... 1.3 meters. I should probably use a not silver <laughs> lens. We're going to take a different lens. Sorry about that. Guys. The everywhere. There you go. Okay. So again, you got a focus tab on this lens. And again, wow, that is really hard to see. Uh, it's about 1.3 meters uh, between 1.2 and 1.5. If I turn this way, pulling uh, towards my left, I'm at 0 0.7 meters. If I push the tab all the way to my right, I'm now at infinity. And you can, Jose, you can come back to me for a sec. Okay. Now here's the thing. What you, if you want to get a lot better at rangefinder focusing and M shooting in general, go around practicing, trying to figure out how far away things are from you. So I think most people know the difference between 0.7 meters, which is two feet or right about here. Like if I can touch Josh's shoulder, right? And if I go to minimum focus distance and I put the camera to my eye, he will be in focus Yeah. with just a small amount of movement like this. Mm -hmm. And that's typically how I'll shoot a portrait. I'm just going to rack the lens all the way to minimum focus, 
before I ever take it up to my eye. Take it up to my eye, and then I'm just gonna lean ever so slightly, throw it in back, and then click the shutter. And it's in focus. If I'm shooting something far away in the city, uh, architecture, well, guess what? You're pretty much at infinity, or right off of infinity. And if you're shooting street scenes that are roughly, you know, uh, one and a half meters, two meters away, or, you know, six, seven feet, well, you're gonna be dead in the middle. And then you can use that as a starting point. What I see a lot of people do, especially starting out with rangefinder, is doing this, hunting back and forth the whole range. And I think everyone knows the difference between this far away and, you know, all the way in the distance. So think about that ahead of time, dial it in on the lens, then lift it to your face and get in that habit because you will be so much faster because you'll be able to, to fine tune focusing either just a little tweak here or just a little leaning forward and back and then shoot. And it's, it's almost instantaneous. There you go. That's good. Yeah. Next question. Okay. How weather resistant is the M system in general? Is it not wise to take an M10 to Iceland? Um, I mean, the, the, M cameras, to me on this. <laughs> the M cameras are not advertised or spec as yeah. weather sealed or weather resistant. So technically they should never get wet. The reality is if you have a common sense approach about it, if it's a light rain and you make yeah. sure a water doesn't pool on it, you don't change lenses or change batteries, memory cards, anything like that, you may be okay. I mean, yeah. we can't make an official statement on that because I mean, it's the, not technically weather sealed. Like if you look at the top of an M, there's really no holes for anything to go in and all the... Right, but as soon as, you, as soon as you turn the focus ring of the lens, you could draw water right, inside. Right, you could draw water inside, inside. that's true. So you have to be very careful. And, and I would suggest, you know, one of the top recommendations we have, I've probably talked about in our uh, landscape and whatever travel series, uh, was, or is, like a little camping towel yeah. that you can keep, one of the little quick drying chamois type things. And if you get some water droplets or whatever, you just yeah, wipe just it off. just don't let it pool on the camera. Right. Or just get it... an SL2 and an SL lens and your problem solved. Or that. <laughs> yeah. SL, yeah. you can stand under a waterfall for 20 minutes and you'll be fine. That's pretty much. Next question. Okay. Is there a way to lock or otherwise control the focus point on the M10, M11 with the EVF? No, you can't lock it in this. I mean, I, I'm trying to formulate a good answer. No, you can't lock the digital focus crosshair. A little crosshair. Yeah. Um, none of the cameras you can actually do that, which is Disappointing. annoying. Disappointing. Um, I don't know why Leica doesn't just do just make that happen on the SLs and the Qs and all again, these things. Again, we have made this point too, yeah. which is this request of saying, look, just give an option for focus point to say right? lock in the middle. Yeah. That's it. I just yeah. want to have a center. So the best trick point. that I can recommend for M11 VisaFlex 2 to avoid accidentally moving your crosshair is I'm actually gonna I'm gonna show this so yeah, you go, guys go. can see what I'm talking about. Um clean off the screen. Can we go to the close-up Jose? That looks pretty sharp. Yeah. Sure. So we go menu, we go to display. It is in a little higher. Lower. So where is it? I don't there know. you go. There we go. Display settings. Can we see that? Yep. EVF L C D EVF or EVF extended, either of these two. And essentially what that's gonna do is never have live view on the rear screen, which means you're never going to accidentally touch the rear screen to relocate the focus crosshair. So this essentially is only for when you have the VZFlex 2 on the camera, but assuming you did, and you set it to EVF extended or EVF, you're only gonna get live view in the VZFlex, meaning the, the rear screen will not, so if I have live view right now, and I start tapping the screen, even accidentally, it's gonna move that crosshair around. So if there is no live view ever on the rear screen, meaning it's always in the EVF, you can't make that mistake. So that's the recommendation I use for using the VisaFlex. And on the SL, you can uh, disable touch in EVF. Correct, and yeah. then on the Q as well. Yeah, um, but why don't you show them that here? I'm gonna put a Well, the question was about the M, so I don't wanna get too distracted. Oh, I thought they said about Q and- No, no, about yeah. the M. Let's keep going, because we got a lot of questions. Next question. Okay. Uh, the original plastic hot shoe cover for M11 seems to be very loose. Is there, there's a risk of loosening it? Uh, is this the case with all M11s? Yes, yeah, so there's uh, little springs inside the hot shoe, and they tend to get a little bit compressed if you use VisaFlexes or thumb supports or thumbs ups a lot. And that makes the hot shoe cover, the little plastic hot shoe cover, just a little bit loose and not fit in the hot shoe, which is super annoying. Uh, my recommendation is to go with an aftermarket hot shoe uh, cover, like the one from Match Technical, um, or 
Leica now makes these really nice aluminum Hachu covers that came out with the Q3, and those are just a little bit thicker, and that solves the problem. But you, the original factory M10, M11 Hachu cover, it doesn't take much for it to no longer fit. Mm -hmm. Seems kind of silly, but that is just like one of those quirks about using those cameras. Next. Okay. Next question. Uh, let's see. What are your favorite older lenses to use on contemporary Leica M cameras? It's all you, man. It's all you do is use lenses you can't buy today. Well, I don't consider them like vintage, but... Uh, I know at least one of them is pretty old now. Yeah, so, okay. So, I have a very hard time giving these particular lenses up that I'm going to say, but I'm going to feel really bad about it when you can't find them. Yeah. Uh, the 18 Super Elmar, absolutely love that lens. It is just phenomenal. It performs exquisitely on the M11, just like it did when it came out with the M8.2, okay? So that was a, a lens that came out with a 10 megapixel camera that performs brilliantly on a 60 megapixel camera. Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to our first question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love it. I can set it at basically like a meter, okay, F8, and everything. Keep okay. <laughs> uh, the 24 Super, uh, 24 Elmar rather, uh, Spheric, which is a sister lens to the 18. They actually came out at the same time. And I love it. It's compact. It's super sharp. I happen to adore 24 millimeter. I use it a lot on the SL2 with the 24 to 90 and 2470. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a crying shame that Leica doesn't make a 24 millimeter M lens at the moment. Sad face. Come on, Leica. Sad Why? face. Sad face. Yep. Why? Why? And then well, there's another one. Um, and then my 90, my favorite 90 is the 90 Elmerit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, for, what version is that, Josh? Uh well the eleven eight eleven eight oh seven which is the product code that's what I would what I would refer to it yeah, as it's it the has, last ninety Elmer it has a little slide out metal shade yeah and it was made it was the lens made up until two thousand six when it was replaced by the ninety Sumerit which if you can't find a ninety Elmerit I actually do like the ninety Sumerit two four which yeah. also is not made anymore <laughs> so yeah that's there you go um, I'll answer it very quickly I would yeah. say um, the last version, version three of the 50 Sumalux pre-aspheric mm -hmm. with the E46 filter si mm -hmm. uh, size and the, the um, th um, retractable lens shade. Mm -hmm. uh, 35 Sumalux pre-aspheric version two, the very late production ones I really like. Uh, that era, like 80s, late 80s, early 90s lenses um, for, for me are a lot of fun on the uh, on the M's. With live view, I never use them with the rangefinder. Right. Next question. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know more about workshops, domestic or international. Anything fun com coming up? Well, that Absolutely. ties in perfectly to what Peter made sure we had to talk about, which yeah, is... Yeah, we do have to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, let me You're bring welcome. that up, actually. If you go to our... While David's doing this, if you go to the workshops event section of our site, everything is listed. That's available. It's got dates, prices, descriptions. Um, we still have a couple of spots left for our fall foliage workshop. Uh, Jose? I don't know. Does this look right? Did I get it right? Just go to the computer. He can fix it. Let's see. You can fix it. Yeah. Right. Bring it up. Yeah, hey! Good right. job. So if you go to workshops and events, Hold David, on. take us there. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, so workshops and events, click on that. And we a lot of things are sold out. Like, actually, I'm leaving one week from today to go to Greenland uh, with my colleague Colin, and we're going to be doing some awesome photography in Western Greenland, uh, which is going to be fantastic. We do have one spot left for the Moab Astrophotography Workshop. And I know a lot of people, we actually got some questions about astrophotography. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's how you do astrophotography. Yeah, if you really want to learn, go on this workshop. Right. Uh, so this was, you know, these are actually from, from the last trip that we did. So you can kind of see uh, how cool that looks. Mm -hmm. And then what's the, what's the one that's There's astro. What's the most important one? Okay. And then uh, we have just listed. Right there. Yep. We have just listed our Like a Photo Adventure uh, New Hampshire, Fall Foliage, and the Maine Coast. And I will be leading that one with my colleague, Colin. And uh, also, so these are uh, some of my shots, but, well, that's a that's our little lead image. But the um, basically, the trip is split into two halves, where we, we start in the White Mountains of New Hampshire and photograph really pretty foliage type things and you know, waterfalls and whatnot uh, along the, you know, beautiful New Hampshire scenery. And then uh, we change gears. And the second half, we go up the main coast in search of lighthouses and working harbors. And um, 
stuff like this, which actually... It's a really fun workshop. I've done it twice uh, over the years, and David has it really dialed in. The locations are awesome. Yeah. The light is beautiful. It is. Um, the food's good, too. The food is good. You're not in the middle of nowhere. You're really going to places that are accessible. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So that one, uh, it, there is only eight people, uh, eight attendees, and Colin and I will be guiding it, so it's our typical one to four ratio. And uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been there a lot, and Colin actually grew up in New England, so we're kind of like home territory for us. All right. I think, that, I think we answered that question pretty well. I think, I think was that? Yeah, that's it. That, yeah. That's it. Okay. Next question. Okay. Loving my M11 monochrome, but I got a tiny piece of dust in the inside of the viewfinder, and it's driving me nuts. Any suggestions how to remove it? I mean, only like a customer care can do that. Um, if, it's, if you can't see it, which you most likely can't, you'll get used to it. It's just like scratches on my watch or, you know, my like putting ding dings on my car. It's just like if it doesn't impact performance, it's overkill to send it in for service. But I would not advise trying to fix it yourself uh, because that would be bad news. Mm -hmm. In using M lenses with the SL2S, is there a way to trigger image magnification for critical focus at f1.4? Uh, not automatically. Just hit the button, though. Yeah, the um, using an M lens on an M camera with live view, because the camera has a physical mechanical moving connection between to the lens, it knows when you're turning the focus ring and it can automatically activate the focus assist feature. SLs don't have that because there is no nothing moving any you know inside there other than just turning the focus ring. So you have to manually activate right. it. But by default, all you have to do is push the rear thumb button once. There you go. All you have to do is push this once and it will magnify. Yeah, so it's very easy to magnify during from the live view with M lenses on the SL. Super single handedly. Simple. Yeah. Next. Literally okay. single handling. Related to that, let's see. No. Okay, any methods to help prevent dust accumulation on a Leica Q Type 116? This is a, a really good question. So, yeah. the short answer is it depends. Oh, <laughs> because you had to go there. <laughs> there are a couple of openings on the Q, the speaker, and the microphone, which allegedly are the things that led dust in, although I don't really believe that. I've it's seen people tape over, over them. Yeah. The problem is it ruins the camera cosmetically like it just i haven't seen any tape that doesn't so is the it's about 250 350 dollars to get a camera a, a q cla including getting the dust taken away versus how an unknown amount of destruction of market value because you've ruined the camera cosmetically you know i sell or we sell a lot of pre-owned cues and I, my general rule is if there's less than five spots on the sensor, I don't worry about it. If there's more than five, I'll send it in for a cleaning, unless they're like huge. But it's maybe only like one in five cameras or one in six cameras that has to actually go in um, to get serviced for dust on the sensor. So every camera, every digital camera has dust on the sensor. Yes, I realize on the Q you can't clean it like you can with another camera, but even an SL or an M, once you clean it, there still tends to be a few spots floating around. So mm -hmm. just clone it on Lightroom, it takes two seconds. All right. Do I need to have the goggles on the 50 Sumo Micron DR to activate close focus on the M11? Can I just use the Visiflex? No, you have to have the no. goggles attached because that little button on move. the top has to yeah. be depressed so that you can engage the macro. That's a mechanical so, limitation. Yeah. So yeah. if you're going to use the DR, the dual range on any camera and you want access to the close focus without trying to rig up something, you I mean, I've want... seen people kind of jimmy it, but it's not advisable. Yeah, it's not a good idea. You want to have the goggles on there. All right. If you had access to both a goggled and non-goggled version of the 35 Cron version one, what are some factors that would make you choose one over the other? Uh, yeah, I can take. That. I know. I'm and I, 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 else, no, so. no, it's fine. And I highly recommend checking out our 35 episode where we showed yes. that exact. Yeah, I mean the application. the goggle version exists like I spoke about earlier mm -hmm. because they are designed to work on the M3. Mm -hmm. They also focus closer, mm -hmm. so that's a huge advantage if you want. Um, to use the lens on even a modern camera. Because the other one was, the non-goggled is one meter? We have the, the 35 Sumo Lux, yeah. not the Cron, but the Lux is a meter versus 0.65. So yeah. that's a big, big difference. difference. They tend to be a little bit more ungainly. They're obviously larger, you know, more prone to having, mm -hmm. because there's more things that can get damaged. It doesn't fit on every camera as well. Sometimes the goggles get in the way. Like it wouldn't work well on an SL2. Yeah, so I think it would just depend on what you were trying to use it on and what your budget was and what you found. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times you don't have to pick up the litter. You know, if you may only find one lens and maybe it's the version with the goggles. Mm -hmm. um, I think I would have both though. <laughs> answer that question. All right, give me one for David. I'm sorry. Yeah, give me one. Give me one. Question for David? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. How many lenses have you dropped? No, no. <laughs> we don't have enough time for that. Not answering that. I am a dedicated back button focus shooter using the toggle switch on the back of my SL2S. So am I. Um, with the current firmware, is there a back button focus solution for the Q2, Q3, or CL? 
No. Uh, no, not not really. No. Okay. Sad face. Sad face. <laughs> I know that's that's another thing that I have yeah. lamented about much, and I think there's. So, for instance, on the SL2, if you go to manual focus, MF, it defaults to having back button autofocus. If on a Q, you would actually have manual focus engaged, how would that then work with the button? Yeah. And I think there that's the issue with, because um, anytime I've asked Leica about it, this is kind of the answer I've gotten. It's like, well, no, we have manual a manual focus and autofocus toggle physically on the lens, and it's physically moving elements inside. How would we then... You know, control that with a with a button. Uh, so I, I don't know if they figured it out, but it would be great if they did because I am also a dedicated back button focus user on the SL and the S yeah. cameras. One day, one day. Next question. Okay, best telephoto and the lens doesn't have a back button. What were you saying, Jose? Best telephoto lens to pair with the thirty five Apple M. Looking for a lens that has similar rendering, contrast, colors, and sharpness. I mean, well. well yeah. There's how, no, how big do you want? There's no... <laughs> the only M lens that's going to come close in performance to 30 Apple M is the 90 Sumalux. I knew you are going to say that. But it doesn't render the same because no. it's, you know, it's the not... The Sumalux versus Sumacron. Um, the 90 Apple SL maybe, but uh, the 35 Apple is kind of from Leica's like 2020 and newer mm -hmm. lens philosophy. So there's nothing... They're still filling that... Kind of filling that in with... I mean, see a few new lenses. I'll tell now. you what has worked well for me yeah, with the M11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I shoot with the 35 Apple as my normal lens on the M11, M11 monochrome. Um, and actually, the last time I went out, uh, I subbed my my prize 90 Elmerit for something a little different, and one of Josh's favorites, mm. which is the 90 Macro Elmar M. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that lens is very, very sharp, holds up extremely well in terms of look to the 35 Apo. You know, and it doesn't get a lot of love because it's yeah. an F4, yeah. and it's collapsible, and it's kind of like a little funky looking, yeah. but... I got to tell you, great for just throwing in your pocket, especially for travel, because collapsed, it's almost the same size as the 35 Apo. Uh, and I think those pair really well together. Uh, if And the thing is, on the newer cameras, on the M11, M11 monochrome, you don't really need, you know, an F2 lens in low light. Like, you could shoot F4 and you're fine because the cameras uh, perform so well, you know, up to, on the M11, like 16,000, and on the monochrome, up to 50,000. So, yeah, check out the... Macro Elmar M. Yeah, and we covered it in our both our macro episode and our telephoto M lens episode. If you want to learn more about it, and, oh, and our underdogs episode, yeah, and that too, we've covered it a lot. We have. Next okay. question. Okay, my Q had an image review option of holding down the shutter release, and the image will display on the back screen. Mm -hmm. I just Hold bought it. an M10, but it seems it does not it does not have this function. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not all the cameras have that. The release half press live view. I've never or, or auto review. Hold, hold, yeah. I've never used it. I mean, I don't use that. Doesn't either. mean there's anything wrong with using it, but I've never so I haven't thought about it. Like, oh, I need that feature, but um, I don't think there is that. Yeah. Oh, there is. So M11. M11. Okay. M11. You can show well, them. What did they say? It didn't have Jose. M10. Which camera? I'm gonna look. M10. At M10. Grab the M10R, which is here, there, 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 right in front of you. Um, here. So you want to go? I'll, I'll look in mine while you look in that. Here is right there. Shutter button pressed for auto review. So there you go. Okay. No. Nope. Oh yeah, it's in here too. It's in the M10R. No, it's not. Let me see. Hold. The hold just means it doesn't go off. Do you have press the shutter? Oh, oh, it's so the M10, opposite, right. so They added it to the M11. Right, the M10 right. doesn't have it. There you go. Hold, right. Hold is sort of, just you can just take a picture and it'll stay on and then you push it to the next. Next question. That's the workaround, I guess. I think that's it. We're not, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, Let's go. Right. I can see about 8,000 <laughs> I know. I know. flooding <laughs> in. Oh, my goodness. I think we're going to have to do double features. Come on. Go, 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 go. Let's do it. All right. Um, Josh, hmm. I'd like to get started <clears throat> in collecting Leica cameras and lenses. Do you have suggestions on where to buy, what to look for, um, things to watch out for, and how to build and protect the collection? Um, yes. Ooh. Go back in time. Yes. Go to Josh's How to Start Collecting <laughs> lecture that right. we gave in person. If you didn't get to attend <laughs> my not streamed Collecting Leica that's lecture right. we, that we had for our 10-year anniversary party, that makes you me wish we really it, right? missed out. <laughs> no, that's the whole point. <laughs> I mean, we could do a whole show about this, but David yeah. and I, we, we talked about this question. Yeah, we did. Um, and David summed it up really well. What did yeah. you say? Because you're in So, I, like anything else, if you're into cars Don't or just, watches just, or pens or whatever, short. start with what you like. Thank you. Yes. If you Collect like what you like. If, yes. And, and a lot of collections start accidentally, where you're like, oh, what's this cool thing? And, oh, this is interesting. And then it just becomes a passion where you start hunting for it and seeking it out. And I think you don't really know where you want to go with collecting until you 
start somewhere. You have to start yeah. somewhere, and I would start just with something that you personally like. Yeah. Don't go in with the attitude of this is an investment mm -hmm. or I'm trying to make money at this. Mm -hmm. Get something because you like it. It gives you pleasure. You enjoy it. You also have to decide when you're going to start collecting. Are you going to collect to collect or are you going to collect to use? Mm, that's true. Neither is wrong or right. They're just different styles of collecting. You could have 15 cameras that all just sit on a shelf and are like museum pieces or 15 cameras that you all, each time you go on a trip, you take a different one. It, you know That also will determine what you buy. So for example... A camera like, I think of a good example, like an M10P Ghost Edition, right? Mm -hmm. Really, really cool special yeah. edition. If I got one on a trade-in or I bought one that was really, really beat up, you, you might immediately say, well, who's going to buy that? That's not collector grade. Well, that's true. It's just the other kind of collector will right. buy that. The kind of collector who likes to collect special things but, use but wants to use them. Absolutely. Wear and tear, it doesn't matter. That's just less for them to worry about. But we'll yeah. do a whole show about this eventually. I, just, I think so. I think it's a good... Yeah, we had to just... The amount of stuff I had to bring to the studio would be insane, so... Yeah. Next question. Sure. All right. What is the average cost and turnaround time for Lens CLA for U.S. Oh, customers? Oh, that's definitely you, Josh. I am not going to say that because I don't know <laughs> what the average cost is. I just pay whatever it costs because it's always worth it. Ooh, wow. That's true. I, 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 you know what? You'd have to ask, like, a customer care. I, I, like, I can't speak for them. And, you know, we send in... A lot. Uh, hundreds of repairs a year. I don't know. I couldn't say. Um, it also depends on what may be wrong with it. If it's just, sometimes you say it's just a CLA and it turns out they you open need, it up. You know, yeah. new element number three needs to be replaced. And it's like, well, Josh said it was only going to be $79.95 and now it's $500. Like, so I don't know. And turnaround the, the time, good, it also depends on. Right. And I mean, the good news is you can send something to like a customer care. Yeah. And they send you back an estimate. Yeah. And you prove it or you don't. Yeah. And the estimate is broken down by what they're going to do, labor right. and parts. It's pretty pretty reasonable. So yeah. so it's not like there's a yeah. big surprise at the I end. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I got the version 2 Sumilux 50mm M with closer focus. I hear Leica optimize this lens for higher megapixel cameras. Any reason why I don't notice any difference in image quality than with the previous version? I mean, the optical formula yeah. is the same right. as the previous one, right? So they didn't change the design. They didn't change any of the internal stuff. What they, what they say that they do is they optimized it for, what did Peter Carver, he said it was like putting, correctly for astigmatism or something like that, yeah. like yeah. taking it to the eye doctor. Right. Where I notice differences are at the extreme, so either minimum or infinity, mm -hmm. but not every time. I don't, if I had a 50 Sumilux version one, I wouldn't get a version two just because I wanted better image quality because they're essentially identical. And we say version one, we don't mean version one. We mean the eleven eight ninety one. The 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 version one is spheric. Um, this in, in most scenarios they're going to perform very similarly. I would get the newer one if I wanted the close focus. If I shot, let's say at f four a lot, and wanted the extra blades. Mm -hmm. um, if I liked the redesigned hood, or if I just wanted to re up. So if I wanted to get a new lens with warranty, maybe mine was getting a little beat one... up, floating around somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah looks like this. Um, but if you just say, well, Josh, you know, I have a 50 Sumilux Spheric version yeah. one. I shoot wide open all the time. I don't care about close focus. Should I get the new one? No. Right. Unless yours is like super beat up and you just want to get a brand new lens. But otherwise, I wouldn't. I mean, I think the close focus is cool. But yeah, like for me, that would be the only reason. I think that the 50 Lux still has a great look. You know, I like to call it sort of a, it's like a budget Noctilux. Yeah. That's a lot smaller. Yeah. That you just don't shoot at F1. There you go. Next. Okay. Regarding the Q3, is there any photographic benefit from optical, le uh, op sorry, optional lens hoods and shutter releases? No, it looks cool. <laughs> looks cool. Well, a shutter release can help you because you can true. use your ed the edge of your finger to fire, so you can have be a little bit where you're not stabbing yeah, at but, it. Yeah, like... but the lenses are just cool. Yeah, they're they're not the lens hoods. Yeah, yeah they're not going to make the pictures any different. I don't know. It's sort of like uh, I don't know styling and anything. Like yeah. if you get cool stuff, you know. Yeah, like accessories on your car. Changing your watch strap or yeah, putting whatever. on a different belt. You know, it's just, it's yeah. not going to change the way the clothes work, but it just looks different. It doesn't change the way the clothes work. It doesn't actually. No. Whoa. Next. All right, for David. Yeah. Um, what would be your go-to SL2S lens or two for two weeks in New Zealand? The subjects being nature and landscapes. Two. Two lenses. You get two. Oh man. <laughs> Only choose two. David uses two lenses in the airport. <laughs> two New Zealand. I don't know what he would use in. Uh, okay. I mean, my all-time favorite, most used lens in the SL system is the twenty-four to ninety. End. Right. Twenty-four to ninety. This is when I go into my Lightroom catalog and I say, okay, what did I shoot the most pictures with? Twenty-four to ninety. It covers most everything you need and offers prime lens performance in convenience and flexibility of a zoom. Okay. 
Wow, number two, really, I'm gonna say, it depends on what you're shooting. If you're mainly gonna be shooting landscape and need something a little more expansive and you're gonna have strong foreground elements, um, then I would say the 1635, which I don't think we have here. I didn't bring that. No. Yeah, 1635. Fantastic landscape lens. That being said, you said also landscape and wildlife or something because you might want something longer, both to give you a little more compression than a 90, or you're gonna shoot birds, animals, close-ups, whatever, and there you could be better served with uh, either a 90 to 280 or a 100 to 400. But I think what you're but what I'm think what I'm getting from your question is is you would be bringing zoom lenses for the kind of oh yes for yeah. sure and yeah, that's, yeah that's a testament to how good and we talked about this before how good those SL Absolutely. zooms are yeah. especially the twenty four to ninety which is ridiculous yeah for sure next question okay is there an available listing spreadsheet or a cheat sheet for standard user profiles that I can use consistently to set up and create some uniformity between my Leica SL cameras yeah no there's a few reasons for this number one. What's the book is if you give him as a cookie? If I were to make some kind of guide for the SL camera and put it out there on the internet, suddenly I'd have to make one for the M11 and the M11 monochrome and the Q3. That's not why, though. And the M10R. No, I'm kidding. The biggest challenge is firmware changes. Right. It's the same reason um, that Leica doesn't include an instruction, a printed yeah, instruction yes, manual. Yes, because there's, the Leica is really, really good, but also bad at yeah. adding new features <laughs> in the sense that, oh, now you have perspective control. Now you have, so it would be... Right. A constantly moving target. Exactly. Um, you know, we have the menu episodes. Yes. And I think some of those episodes are probably a little bit out of date. I can't think I, of you know, specific it's examples. So but I was I yes. was almost positive. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, this is it. Because I um, we actually didn't talk about that, but I did an entire with Josh's. Oh, we're very, getting there. We'll very, talk about yeah, that. Yeah, very helpful assistance. Shortly. We have a whole rundown of all the current firmwares that we'll we'll talk about that in a minute, or minutes, whatever. Um, and in doing that research, I went back to some of our menu episodes, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's out of date now. Yeah, so that's yeah. that's the real, I mean, I'm giving, making a joke, but the real reason is it just would be chasing a moving target. But it doesn't mean that you can't ask us or any qualified, well, we like a yeah. store or anyone who knows about the cameras or figure it out. I mean, this it's just a matter of it's not practical. Yeah. Uh, we could do it for like an M6 <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> there's, no, there's no menu. Because uh, that camera ain't changing, although... wait. M10D. M10D, yes. Yeah. No, because you could use the Visaflex and there's oh, menu stuff. Oh, yeah, no. oh, okay. Okay, next question. Okay. What are your favorite JPEG settings on the M10? What's JPEG? We don't shoot JPEG, so you're asking the wrong, the wrong people. I'm sure there's someone in the chat who probably loves it, which is I, fine. We don't shoot JPEG, so... Yeah. I, I apologize this, for this every time I do a camera review and I say, you know, I can't speak to the JPEG quality because I never shot any. I, I shoot raw. I'm a raw shooter. I, you know... I shot negative film when I wanted to make prints yeah. because I could correct them. Uh, I just don't shoot JPEG. Yeah, sorry. Nothing wrong with JPEG. No, it's fine. If that's what you prefer, I mean, I'm not going to tell you how to use your camera. I but, just don't know. But I would say the best JPEG setting is this. If you are so inclined to say, you know what, I just want to simplify, I want to use JPEGs, and have the images right away, I would highly encourage you, given the low cost of memory cards, mm. to shoot DNG plus JPEG and just put the DNGs away for safekeeping when down the road you say, you know what? I wonder, what do those DNGs look like? And then you'll yeah. have them there. Yeah, good advice. Mm -hmm. Next question. Okay. Are we in the golden era of Leica lens development? My guess is every head of optics at Leica in their own time would have thought that. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to know what the future may hold. Ironically, it's like, are we in the golden age of computing? I, I think one yeah. thing that's that's different now than ever before yeah. are the classic series lenses, like you were talking mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. Thambar, One Two Noctilux, Steel Rim, Sumeron, mm -hmm. because it's almost like these lenses are so unbelievably good. These new Apos, um, SL and M, that like is kind of saying, well, now that we're giving you this pinnacle of performance, why don't we also throw it back mm -hmm. and give you something else? So. Th things are good, but you know there's a really, really, really incredible back catalog of 70 years of M lenses that are a lot of fun. So I think it's just a matter of taste. I mean, ob objectively speaking, if we take a look at, I, I would say the the top level performance is represented in the SL lenses. The zooms are as good or better than M prime lenses, and the prime lenses for the SL, you know, the the Aposumicrons, are better than any other lens that Leica's ever made yeah. in those respective focal lengths. Yeah. Period. We've said that a lot, but I'm always happy to repeat it. The right. if you come to me and you say, Josh, what I care about is absolute image quality, 
and nothing else, or that's the first priority, mm -hmm. SL2 or an SL2S mm -hmm. with any or all of the five Apo SL primes, because there is nothing in the Liger product portfolio that does a better job when it comes to outright performance. Correct. Next question. Okay. Uh, what are your favorite M mount lenses with character and beautiful imperfections? That sounds like us. We are we have beautiful imperfections. I'm mostly you. Um, I, I have a couple, but you go. No, first. no. Well, you should go first because I can okay. see you have something to say. Um, actually, I like two lenses that were that share the same design, which is the 50 Sumalux, which we talked about, mm -hmm. and the 75 Apo Sumicron M. Hmm. Um, I think it's sort of it's really really good, but it also has some imperfection to it uh, where it's not. You know, as as it's definitely not as sharp as say the the SL version to go back to that, and and I've done some comparisons and it it's like not even that close, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's absolutely stunning for for portraiture and for detail work. I think it's it's luscious. You know, I would say the 50 Sumalux Aspheric version one or two, mm -hmm. and the 75 Apo Sumicron, uh, they are based on the same design. They're both designed by Peter Carva, and um, yeah, I think they're those are really Beautiful lenses. There you go. Um, what do you got? I think they were asking about though, like lenses that aren't perfect. I Which mean, those lenses aren't, really, not but maybe they meant something older. Oh, I mean, I've got a million choices, but I think. What do you think? Well, for me, the number one is actually a lens you can still buy, which is the 90 Apo. Hmm. I think people see the word Apo and they assume, oh, 30 Apo, 50 Apo, it must be like those. It's not. Right. 90 Apo is a portrait lens. It's a magic lens. It's more of a look lens. If you expect it to work like a 50 Apo, it's not, and you're going to be disappointed. But if you appreciate it for what it does or what it doesn't do, it's very, very special. Uh, and one of the cool things about that lens, it's been out for so long that the used market is really, really price friendly. So sure. if you want to get a 90 Apo, you do not have to spend 5000 plus on a new one. You can get a used one, a really, even like hmm. the best used ones with warranty and everything are going to be 4000 or less. Hmm. Okay. Listen to you. I mean, I can speak to what we've sold. I, don't know what else is out there. Yeah. Good question, though. What's All next? Right. One general Leica related hot take. General Leica related hot take. Can you define hot <laughs> yeah. take? We're not with it. Something controversial? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that's what it means. We're like, uh, uh, this right. is an interesting question that I can't answer immediately. Um, Let's come back to that. I don't really have any hot takes because my job is to help other people out with their stuff. I don't know if I have. Hmm. Um, like, controversial? Controversial. Yeah, I don't. My, my, my our opinions are pretty mainstream. Oh well, okay. Um, your hot take <laughs> is you don't use lens caps. I don't use lens That's caps. That's David's. Like, David's like, David's like a hot take. It's like is lens caps are useless. That's David's hot take. Um, <laughs> and no lens shades. And lens shades. Well, I feel the same way yeah. about that. Um, I don't know if I have any other ones. If we think of one, we'll, we'll come back to this. I'm sure you do. <laughs> you just don't want to share. <laughs> pretty them, funny. Yeah. <laughs> you caught us off guard. That's good. What's next? Okay. Um, what am I going to get my Q3? Well, I'm right here now. Um, <laughs> you get a Q3. That's right. <laughs> our, our last episode was about the Q3, yes. and I and I went on a pretty good rant about this. The short answer is I have no idea because it just doesn't work like that until the camera's in stock. Then I could say you could have it now. Yep. But we're months away from the Q3 being in stock, at least at, at like a store Miami. We should talk about because um, it's nine o'clock, David. Yeah. The article that you and I worked on together. Well, you yeah, worked yeah. on the article, so. I'll bring it up. We have done a couple of episodes about firmware. I have done my best to drill it into everyone's head who watches the show that having current firmware on your camera is really, really, really important. But I realized that Leica's website trying to find firmware on it is not great. Older cameras tend to just disappear. So what we did is we created a post on Red Dot Forum that is one place to find every single current like a firmware version for every camera that Leica has made. Every digital had, camera. Every, yeah, every digital camera. That's had a firmware update. Mm -hmm. You want to cut to the computer screen? Yeah. There we go. So there's yeah. Red Dot Forum. So if you scroll down, or to where is technical it? Technical articles. There you go. And there it is. So click on that. Leica firmware master list. Yes. So scroll down, and you'll see it's sorted by system. And you can either click on the system there to jump to it, or just scroll down the whole list if you yep. want. There you go. And it covers every single camera that's ever had a firmware update. And when there is a relevant article on Red Dot Forum about the firmware, we link to it. So this is going to be updated every time there's a new update. We'll put it here, and we are hosting the files ourselves. So if Leica does whatever, it won't matter because the files come from Red Dot Forum. So if you want to know, you know, what the current firmware is, what's a well, when did it come out, an article about it, and also to download it, this is the place to go. You should bookmark this, save it, whatever. 
because I think that this is going to be a really, really valuable resource, not just for people with their current cameras, but if you go out and you buy a used M240 or a used CL and you want to make sure the firmware is current, which you should do right away, this is going to be the place to do it. I'm going to drop a link right now. Yeah, good idea. Sweet. All right. There you go. Let's ask it. Let's do another question. Okay. Let's go. There we go. <laughs> hey, let's see. Uh, 28 millimeter L Merit spherical version two has lens hood with size that doesn't really make any sense. Any alternative hood that is smaller in size? I mean, the, her, the I hood. I just don't use the hood. Yeah, right? just, just take it off. Just take the hood off and use a thread ring. And there, it can't be replaced either. So yeah, there's. What do you mean can't be replaced? Wait, are we talking? No, about the, the version two with the metal hood. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, that's the oh. the eleven six seventy seven. Oh, um, never mind. Yeah. I was thinking about the. Um, that's the one two four sixty hood. So that yeah. hood you can easily get, but mm. it's um. No, it's obnoxiously large for the size of the lens. I find it hilarious. So I just use the thread ring, and I wouldn't use a hood at all. I don't ever ho use hoods because for me, I use polarizing filters for almost everything that I do, mm. and a hood impedes access to the filter to change it. So you'll rarely find me with a lens hood um, out in the field. Good question, though, because it is funny how that works. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay. It's not the largest one, though. Remember the 19R lens? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was monstrous. Yeah. Bigger than the lens. Oh, boy. All right. All right. Got a very nice used Q2 from you recently. While well, the mechanical shutter is very quiet, basically the same as the electronic, it may be too quiet. Is there a way to increase the mechanical shutter sound a bit? No, no, it's it's a leaf shutter. Yeah, it, inherently it's quiet. You could uh, you could put a you could tape a microphone to the lens <laughs> and then have a Bluetooth speaker ta <laughs> attached to a backpack. Don't. I mean, you could do it. It actually reminds you, me. Wait, wait, couldn't you take a Bluetooth lav mic? Oh, please no. Attach it to the camera. <laughs> And then have a, like those backpacks that have Bluetooth speakers built in oh, and have no. a transmission to the... Yeah. No, no. I'm going to invent this. It's going to happen. The answer is no. No, it's, you cannot. It's, it's extremely quiet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not the only one. Also, going... Uh, any any M camera from the M10P forward also has a extremely quiet mechanical shutter. Um, not as quiet not as, as, as the Q cameras. The Q cameras are really, the Q really cameras, quiet. The Q cameras, like... Because yeah. it's moving such a small amount yeah. in a circular fashion. So Next question. Okay. Can you get replacement thread rings for the 28 millimeter Sumalux? Probably. No. They, it's Maybe. not. The thing is, okay, the 28 millimeter Sumalux is an, an unusual lens. I don't have one here, but the thread ring isn't the traditional one that covers the lens hood threads. The thread ring covers the inner threads, which are for an E49 filter. Right. I would never bother using it in the first place. I don't know why it even has it. I've seen some newer ones from Leica that don't even come with it. We have sold a replacement part in the past. It is on our website. It can take years to get sometimes. I mean, I don't know. So there is no way, there is no ring that goes over the hood threads, meaning if you wanted to use the 28 Sumalux without the hood, you can't. But the thread ring for the filters is on and off again, available sometimes. Hmm. Yeah, it's weird. Next. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, uh, SL Sumalux 50 1.4 versus M Noctilux? 0.95 on the SL 2S. Hmm. I mean, personally, I'd probably err on the side of the of the 50 Sumalux SL. It's a it's a beautiful lens, and the different. I mean, they both have a really kind of very pleasing rendering, and we we often kind of refer to the 50 Sumalux SL as the Noctilux of the SL system. No, it doesn't have the you know 0.95. It's 1.4. The big, big difference uh, separating those. They're both very creamy rendering, wide open. Uh, the biggest difference is that the 50 Sumalux is tack sharp, wide open in the center, and the 50.95 is not. Yeah, well, those two lenses are incredibly different. I mean, they are. I've shot them side by side somewhat recently, so that's why I get Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. let's hear you. <laughs> let's hear your take. Because... Then there is nothing that looks like the 0.95. Anywhere from f2 to 0.95, nothing looks like that lens. The way that the focus falls off from the center out, and the way you can get separation of subject, even focusing further out, like 15, 20, 30 feet, there's nothing else that does that. Relative, especially to the sharpness of the center, compared to like the f1, mm. 50 Sumalux SL, True. way, way sharper. Yeah. Doesn't have anywhere near the character, but That's it's nice a really character. nice way to have a beautiful bokeh Mm -hmm. Just doesn't have a lot of like swirls and cool Noctilux. That's look. true. Okay. It's also much larger, but also autofocus and weather sealed, and focuses closer. So, they're hard. They're too difficult. They're hard to compare because they're so different. I think you have to determine first what is the look you're going. Well, for. I'm curious. Yes. Taking that into account, so yes. the the 50 Sumalux focuses down to 0.45 yes. meters. Yes. The the Noctilux focuses to one meter. Yes. 
I mean, that's a big difference. Huge difference, yeah. yeah. So, if you're doing portraits and other close-up stuff, I mean, you couldn't use the Noctilux for that. Yeah. But half a meter difference, is that enough to negate the difference in no. depth of field? No, no, no. The Noctilux, the Noctilux just does something that no other lens can do in terms of the way it separates the in-focus from the out-of-focus and the way the character... When you look at a Noctilux image, even if you don't know how why it looks different, you know that it looks different, mm. in my experience. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. What's next? Okay. It depends on the use case, bottom line. It depends. Yeah. yeah. It we depends. have a whole episode called Depends. You should go back and watch that after this. It depends. Okay. Are you limited to only SL lenses in order to use perspective control on the SL2S? Uh, yes. I don't think, I don't know. Uh, here, try it with an M lens. <laughs> I don't, actually, I, I don't I, know. I, no, I don't use it. David uses it. I, I think I think you can only use it on SL lenses, but let me double check. Fire me me. Yeah, I'm, I'm mounting the adapter upside down, <laughs> obviously. Okay. That's what we do. You're a little rusty. I know. Wow, there's no paint on that lens. Okay. So let's do perspective control. Do, 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 do. We're discovering this together. This is a journey that we're all on right now. Perspective control is activated. Please make sure to set the lens. Correctly. There we go. So the yes. answer is yeah. It works fine. I mean, here you can show them. Yeah. Not much I can really show here, but well, it's just a white box. But I promise you, it is active. Lift up higher there. Uh, it does. It does work. So cool. yes, the answer is yes. You can use it with an M lens. I didn't think you could. There we go. But that's why we test. See, look, this journey was successful. Next question, please. It's not a. I don't know. It's I don't know yet. Exactly. Right. Okay. Let's see. I noticed many use SL lenses have had their motor serviced. How often is this maintenance needed? Well, you're looking at our S, S, S lenses, our S lenses mm -hmm. not SL lenses. There was an issue with the autofocus motor gearing of like a SSM lenses, that's their medium format lens, that has been resolved for a number of years, but any S lens that was manufactured before that fix was issued, before the motor was fixed, is gonna, for at least the ones that we're gonna sell, is gonna go back to the factory have the new motor installed so it doesn't you can, doesn't you fail. Show them this. Yeah, David wrote an article on Red Dot Forum about it. There it is. Like announces fix for S lens focus. That was motor. 2017, so it's been quite a while. But that's um, if you're looking at lenses with new focus motors, they're going to be S lenses, and you generally only want to buy one with a new focus motor unless you're getting a smoking deal on one without it. Being aware you're going to have to send it to to Leica to get the motor replaced at some point. Mm -hmm. SL lenses, no, I've never seen a focus motor fail on an SL lens. I'm sure no. it's happened to somebody. It's a, completely, <laughs> it's a completely different kind of motor. Yeah. The um, the S lens motors, um, the system's different. So SL lenses use a fly-by-wire system, so there's no mechanical linkage on the lens to the focusing. Mm -hmm. uh, S lenses, by contrast, have a full mechanical manual focus and a full mechanical autofocus with a uh, clutchless system. A very, very complicated mechanically. And um, they're also much, much larger with massive pieces of glass to drive. And what would happen is the little gears would snap on the original design with uh, too much torque being applied. Mainly, I mean, the 120 was the worst culprit, but on, uh, on all of them eventually. Cool. Next. Okay. Let's see. Uh, all right. Can you share a few details over your use of polarizers? Oh. I'm surprised to hear you say you always use one, Josh. Sure. Well, 90% of what I photograph is automotive stuff because that's what I like to shoot. So when you're photographing a car, especially out and about, not in the studio, your primary objective when it comes to the car itself is controlling reflections uh, in the windows, in the paint, and a polarizing filter allows you to do that. I, if I went out without with a camera without a polarizer, I probably wouldn't even bother pointing at a car because it's just it's it's not gonna do what I want. So for me, um, because I do automotive work a large percentage of the time, I pretty much I have you know if you were to look at my office, I have a stack of polarizers about this high, every single size from 39 all the way to 80 or to 95. So I'm always ready with a polarizer regardless of what lens it is because I know that I'm gonna need it for what I'm shooting. David uses them for landscape all the time because they're great for managing reflections on wet rocks, um, darkening the skies, wet leaves, things like that. So All those things. Yeah. So I always use a polarizer. I use both Breakthrough and Leica polarizers. I'm indifferent. I use them both. They both work great. Um, but I have yeah. one in every size for every lens. And because of that, I'm not using UV filters because you never want to stack filters. And I'm not using lens hoods because the hood inherently gets in the way of being able to adjust the polarizer because... The most important thing to understand about using a polarizer is it's not a set it and forget it. 
you do have to adjust it every time you move the camera or your subject moves. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. If I need a lot of gear service at once, what is the best way to do it? Uh, well, you, you, you know what, when one of your friends is moving away and you have like a goodbye <laughs> party and you're like, everybody's crying and there's cake. That's what you would do for your equipment. You just kind of lay it out because, I mean, it depends on what it is. You know, M bodies, digital M bodies sent to the U.S. can be done in weeks sometimes. Uh, like, I can't, don't hold me to that, but I've certainly seen it be pretty fast. Lenses, you know, if it's got to go to the U.S. Uh, to customer care in New Jersey, and it's a basic CLA, they're pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, credit to, to Janine and, and her team there. If it's got to go to Germany, or if it's a film camera, or it's an exotic lens, or a vintage lens, I mean, it could take you a year. Just send it all in at once. And say goodbye, have a tearful goodbye. And all right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Just, sorry, Justin's sorry, being too weepy here. I'm being traumatized by this, because I have to do this all the time. So. Next. All right, are there any optical advantages to adapting S lenses on the SL system? Yeah, I, I mean, they have a good, uh, sometimes. So, and, and again, I'm gonna point you to another article I wrote, which is, I did a, I'll actually navigate oh, yeah, there. Yeah, it's a good article. Uh, the S Lens Compendium, which is uh, yeah, it's something. The S Lens Guide. I I the S Lens, I mean, let's see what happens. There we go, uh, yes. So I have something called the Definitive Guide to S Lenses, where I gave a whole, that, oh, there's my hot take right there, in, <laughs> in action. No okay. caps. That's this, that picture is when I first tested the S007 in Iceland, and you can see I just opened my bag to photograph the lenses. I did not stage that photo. Yeah. That is actually what my bag looks Shield like. Shield your eyes, viewers. Shield your eyes. Shield children. Not, not for children. <laughs> anyway. um, and I, I do explain uh, the physics of why S lenses look the way they do on the S cameras, and if you want to get into that, you can kind of explore. Uh, talking about differences in, in depth of field, yada, yada, yada. Um, but I do give a rundown lens by lens with, with actual examples that I shot on every generation of camera from the S2, S006, S007, and the S3 with all these lenses. So you can take a look through, take a gander if you want to get an idea of the, of the character of each of these. I mean, these are actually S2 images back from Beautiful. a long time ago. Yeah, that's, nice. that's Savannah. So yes. is that. Um, what I'll say is um, M lenses, or excuse me, S lenses adapted with the S adapter L on the SL cameras, they're, the way they render is almost like an M lens on steroids. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not as biting and as critically sharp as the SL lenses. They have more character closer to M lenses, but not exactly the same. Yeah. But of course, you're getting autofocus weather sealing yep. and electronic aperture control, which you don't get with M lenses. So it's kind of a nice difference. Uh, and there's all kinds of good deals on used ones out there. And it's insane, insane deals. Yeah. It's Just fun. make sure, make sure, make sure it has a new focus motor. Yes. Please. Um, and they are, yeah, they're phenomenal lenses. Yeah. Next question. And, um, yeah. Let's keep going. All that. Okay. Are there any brand or technical specs on an SD card that are known to cause problems with Leica cameras? Jose, you can answer this one. Uh, the Sony Tough Cards. Yeah, we, are, we see failures with them yeah. sometimes. At least that we know of, those are problematic. And don't use micro SD cards and adapters, Oh, please. gosh, no. Correct. No, no, please, please, <laughs> use please. Use an SD card. Yes. But that's it. I, I haven't used enough. We like Lexar and SanDisk, but there's other good brands out there. Mm -hmm. That's what we like. Okay. Next. What is the best M lens between 28 and 50 millimeters with a lot of character, but minimal chromatic aberration? First of all, chromatic aberration is irrelevant now because it's so easy to fix in Lightroom Click. that I could care less about it. I don't care. Now, if you're shooting, we you're shooting film, you can scan it. So, what was the question again? Take out the part of the chromatic between aberration. Between 28 and 50, which means you mean 35. Between 28 and 50 millimeters. That's I 35. think they mean between. I don't really understand this question. Is it 28? Choose between 50? a 28 or a 50, or what's in between 28 and 50? In between 28 and 50 is a 35. I mean, if you want a 28 with character, you would get a 28 lux. 28 lux, super yeah, lux. That looks sure. amazing. And that also is very low on chromatic uh, aberration. Yeah, if you want a 50 with character, I mean, jeez, uh, so many options. I mean, modern, I would say 50 simulux. 50 lux, yeah. Yeah, I and then so. I'm going to make the same recommendation in the middle, 35 simulux. Yeah. Next. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, just get yourself a lux. There you go. Uh, do you guys ever use Leica half cases? I like mine without it. At the same time, it feels good when I have it on, but it doesn't feel like I like it. Well, I mean, a half case, this is an example of a half case uh, for the M11 that Leica offers. 
It's gonna serve really two primary functions. One is it's going to offer some protection to the bottom and the sides and a bit of the front of the camera. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a particularly rugged environment or bouncing it around a lot. Two, it's gonna change the way the camera feels. You may prefer the feel of the leather over the metal and fake leather. That's a personal preference. Um, now the half cases have like battery doors and stuff. It's no longer an issue to have to take it off and change batteries. But in the old days, that was more annoying. It comes down to personal preference. Um, I don't usually have a half case on there. Sometimes I do. S sometimes I think like a beautiful Arte D'Amato half case, that, like a dark brown, just looks gorgeous on a silver camera. Half cases have been around for years. I mean, the screw mount cameras had them, oh M3 gosh. had them. It's not a new thing. Yeah. So, yeah. We see lots of like degrading ones. Yeah, just a matter of, but I do like the green. Um, that is kind of cool. On the M11. Oh. Mm. That does look pretty cool. That does look cool. That does look cool. So like uh, that's, that's like a cosmetic enhancement, like the hoods for the Q. Uh, I just want to, sorry, I just want to answer something I saw. Sure. Uh, Joe says about Lexar, don't use them. Um, Why? I don't know. But I mean, I just grabbed a whole bunch of Lexar cards. I mean, David has used hundreds of Lexar cards. And I've never had a single one like, fail. Literally, more than most people who, other than people who work for Lexar, I would guess. Yeah. I mean, these are, so... I'm going to give my recommendation, though, to go in a little more depth because memory cards are important. It's yeah. our digital yeah, film. Yeah, you should, yeah. Uh, so I use the Lexar 1667X. You can, Jose, you can link to them or Lorena, yeah. you can link to them um, on uh, their site. They're 250 like. megasecond, UHS-2 cards. They've been rock solid. And I've used them everything from uh, Q2, Q2 monochrome, M11, M10, M10R, SL2, SL2S. No problems. And I would say... Uh, Maybe it's because of my methodology, which is I only use memory cards once. I fill them up and I put yeah. them away. And I don't have any read-write failures because yeah. they're fresh. I mean, I think every brand is prone to have some failure somewhere. So if you Google like insert brand here, yeah. failure, you're going to find something. But we well, can only you went to, to Vetzler and they told them, but I mean, we've used, and all of our customers use Lexer all the time. For and years never and years and years and years. Yeah. Problems, yeah. But, yeah. You know. That's just our experience. Yeah. yeah. Next. Okay, uh, should I purchase the new 35 millimeter steel rim? Is there a good alternative classic 35 1.4? Well, you should watch our 35 Sumlox episode because we <laughs> spent a lot of time covering this. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is, yeah, you have a whole back catalog of 35 Sumloxes. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be as inexpensive as the steel rim, relatively speaking, but you've got a lot of options. Steel rim is fun. Steel rim is a fun way to get a vintage lens, brand new, in the box with a warranty. We covered this already. Yeah. yeah. But watch that episode if you can. Not right now, though. Like, wait till after. And then but, what? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Next. Okay. Uh, let's see. If you're going to walk around the city with a camera on your shoulder, do you turn off the camera after each time you stop to take pictures, or do you leave it on all day? Uh, depends. I usually... <laughs> you're killing me right now. I, I usually turn it off as I drop it to my side, and then I usually turn it on as I'm lifting it up. Uh, I guess I've just gotten in that mindset. Um I didn't do that the last time when I was walking around with the Q3 because the battery life is so insanely good mm. uh, that I just left it on. And I think it, you're hitting yeah. on a good point, which yeah. is we're seeing all the newer cameras coming out have better and better battery life each yeah. time, like Q3, M11, et cetera. Mm. So I think you could do that. You could leave them on all day and be fine. You know, we always have spare batteries with us as yeah, well. Yeah, always, always. So the answer is, out of habit, yes, I turn off the camera. And it's it's sort of a habitual thing where I take a picture, flip the switch, put it down, yeah. walking around, I see another shot, and I'm flipping the camera on and presetting the lens if it's an M before I lift it up to my eye and then shooting and everything's ready to go. Uh, on an SL, I mean, typically it's more purposeful and I'm and it's on the whole time I'm walking around with it or it's on a tripod because I'm shooting something. But um, so I'd say it depends on how many batteries I have and what camera it is. Okay. What do you got next? Let's see. Um, how different is performance on the Trial Mart 16-18-21 or a yeah. Prime on the M11 Monochrome? Sure. So, well, mm -hmm. the biggest difference between the Trial Mar, well, okay, let me back up for a second. Here, and they... You don't have a lot of options for Prime wide angles anymore, right? When you go new, you have 21 Sumalux, which is totally different, or 21 Super Elmar, which is better optically, but if you want to go wider than 21, now the 16, 18, 21 is the only option you've got. So it's hard to say how does it compare because there's not a lot of choices. If maximum performance is your goal, you should get an SL2 with a 1635. If maximum wide angle M lens performance is your goal, get the 21 Super Elmar. Mm -hmm. 
It's also easier to filter because it has a standard E46 thread versus the twenty one uh, the, the wide-angle trial mar, which has to have an adapter. But if you want to go 20, 19, 18, 17, 60 millimeters, you can't do it any other way with an M with anything that's part of the current portfolio. Mm -hmm. And the wide-angle trial mar does an excellent job. Performance is very good. It just doesn't have any real like a magic, but it's so wide that what do you need that for anyway? If you really want like a magic and you want to go wide, you get a 21 Sumalux, and that's a whole other conversation. But that's not the, at all the There's same. There's no performance there at all. No, that no, lens no, is just no. like a not the just like wide angle look. Yeah. But a good question. Yeah. Uh, personally, I have used the wide angle Trialmar. Tri I uh, use it for a period of time on back in the M8, M9 days, and took some great shots with it because that was what was available. Uh, 16 is super easy. F8, one meter, everything's in focus. Yeah. Um, these days, I, I prefer the 18 because I think it's a little bit more high performing than the wide angle trial mar, but it's also not 16. So if you really want that ultra wide, yeah, the wide angle trial mar is still a really good option. Yeah, there you go. Will anyone from Lancaster, Miami be going to the October LSI meeting in Germany? Yeah, Kirsten and I will be there. Yeah, I haven't booked my flight yet, but we'll figure that out. We'll but yeah, that out. <laughs> I'm, I'm signed up. Just gonna swim. I'm signed up, <laughs> I'll be there, it's gonna be fun. If you buy me a beer, I'll let you borrow any lens you want. Wait, how many lenses do you bring? <laughs> I don't know. Well, how All many beers am I going to drink? <laughs> Next. Uh, what would you buy today? The old Leica Sumilux 35mm spherical or the new FLE version 2? Wait, the old, so the pre-FLE? Or, or really? just the FLE? Yeah, he didn't mention. Well, I mean, that that just depends. I mean, it, yeah. I hate, you know, we're saying that a lot, but... Yeah. It depends on your budget, on what's available, on what you want to do. I mean, the, the older Tsumaluxes, again, if you watch that show, are super fun. Uh, but they don't have the performance. I mean, the FLE, David has shot for years. Yeah. And, um, the version, and the version 2. He's even better than that. Focus, like, so yeah. I think it depends on a lot of factors that I don't know that you didn't. I mean, it all, question, right. So. It, it, again, it depends on your personal preference, your personal style of what you're after. Are you looking for, you know, technical performance? Uh, are you looking for close focus or are you looking for kind of a vintage look? <laughs> yeah, question. What can you do to make the weight of the SL body lighter? I see you go to the gym. That's what I, that's what I would do. <laughs> no, uh, use this. Use, yeah, use one of the, uh, the non-APO SLs or a TL lens. This is so light. Um, so in fact, uh, our colleague Peter, who runs our workshop program, uh, you know, we're, we're doing kind of a requisition for some new new gear. And I was like, Peter, what do you want? And he says, oh, I want a 50 SL. And I said, oh, the uh, the Apo SL? He's like, no, 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 the, the, the new one, the non-Apo SL. I want to get like a super lightweight uh, 50, 50 Sumacron non-Apo with an SL2S, and that's going to be like my go-to walk around. And I'm like, okay. I want to so, talk about, we got this question, very, very, very we got this question a couple of times, so I'll, I'll like sort of yeah. shorten it and, and answer it. Um, it's not a secret that customers, especially over the, you know, prior to the last few months have had issues with the M11. We get this question about M11 freezing or locking up or odd behavior. And somebody, I think, gave us a hard time on one of our shows recently because we didn't address it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, David and I have had what I would say is a positive experience with the M11. Definitely, yeah. So I can't speak from experience saying, oh, it freezes up all the time because I wouldn't put up with that. I would just either have it fixed or replaced. Um, the few customers over the last year that have come to me um, or David with mm -hmm. M11 issues, let's say they buy a new camera, it's not working right, we just replace it. You know, I'm not going to give them a chance to go on the internet and complain about it because I'm going to just give them a new one. Right. Because that's what we do. You know, I think there have been enough firmware updates now that clearly Leica is trying to uh, do something. Right. Yeah, they're not. For sure. They're not um, ignorant to the problem because they've issued a number of updates. Do I think that the newest firmware update means 100% of the cameras are going to be perfect 100% of the time? No. I don't think that's possible. I mean, I had an SL2 freeze on me the other day, and that's been out for like five years. So I can't speak from the side of what it's like to go through like two or three or four cameras and customer care and this because we haven't had to deal with that. Um, certainly, I've had a very, very small percentage, less than 1% of the cameras that we've seen. Yeah, I have had a problem. Not recently, but... Yeah. And we just replaced them. So, like, if you yeah. if you probably took a look at the numbers of fully functional M11s mm -hmm. versus not, you know, 100% functional M11s, it, it's disproportionate to what you might be reading online because it's it's this. Um, there, there's actually like a, yeah. a name for this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where 
the happy people don't say anything. It's only people who are yeah. are having issues that tend to be the most vocal about it, yeah. and with good reason. Because yeah. look, if you get, you get an expensive you know M11, yeah. you expect it to work. I, obviously, yeah, we get it. We're like, right. we we don't want to be dismissive no. of somebody that has a like camera that has a problem. But there's solutions. But we also are not going to, A, speak for Leica as a whole because we can't and speak to the entire M11 user base as a whole because we can't. We can right. just speak to the experiences that we've had. Um, and I think overall the experiences have been good. And the reality is Leica is a small company. They make products in small quantities. When there's a seismic shift in a product design, like we saw from the M10 generation to the M11, mm -hmm. it is logical to assume there are going to be some teething problems with new tech, new firmware, who knows what else? So yeah. if it's a concern, you have a few options. Don't buy an M11. Okay, fine. Or get an M11 from someplace that you know is going to stand behind it and support you when there is a problem. And that's not just going to be like a store in Miami. I'm not going to be that selfish. I think all the Leica stores are great places for that. But if you go online, you try to get a good deal, you buy something gray market, that's cool. But don't expect to get a lot of support when you have an issue. So I think that's one of the advantages of, of a shop like us, but not just us um, for that. So... Again, I don't want to be dismissive of, of any of that. Right. I mean, I would say, yeah. yeah, any reputable Leica dealer is just going to take care of it. Like, they're going to make sure that you are taken care of or the camera gets fixed. I, I also see in the chat that um, someone actually went to Vetzlar with their M11. Yeah. And they're working on it. Right? Leica, them, the thing is, yeah, Leica Leica knows right. when there's an issue. It just, it's not like they can snap their fingers. Leica has to go through so many permutations of testing, firmware, testing, so testing, much testing. testing yeah. They do actually care. If they didn't care, they would have left it on 1.00 and said, good luck. So right. M11 has only been out for a year and a half, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. January. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's pretty new considering that the M10 so was out for five years. So, sure. you know, I'm just willing to give Leica the benefit of the doubt that they're going to continue to make sure that everyone has the best reliability and performance out of their M11s and M11 monochromes possible. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get a camera from us and have an issue, please come to me. Come to David, come to Jose, come to any of us and tell us. You know, don't just keep it a secret or go online or tell me in the chat six months later. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Sure. And now we're done talking about that for now. Moving on. Yes. Okay. Hey, guys. M10 monochrome or M11 monochrome? Why? Well, we have a whole show about the M11 monochrome. We do. And we compared it to the M10 monochrome and talked about all the reasons. Yeah. But in a nutshell, nothing at all wrong with the M10 monochrome. Stunning image quality. Performance up to 25,000, 32,000 ISO. 40 megapixel, nothing to sneeze at. Uh, great optical viewfinder. Um, I would say the biggest differences with the M11 is going to be uh, a bit, you know, notching a little higher in terms of ISO performance where you can shoot cleanly up to 40,000, 50,000 ISO. Also, the... Um, the electronic viewfinder experience is significantly better uh, with the uh, the new Visiflex support. Oh, you don't have that. Can you take me to the LSM homepage? We have a great uh, table. Here. Here. Uh, oh, I didn't see it there. That actually compares the M11 monochrome to the M10 monochrome on our website. I just want to take me take us there real quick. Um, sorry to interrupt you, David, but if I you think go I have to, this in the article, yeah, too. if you go to the M11 monochrome on our website, like a Click on compared to M10 mono. Uh, David and I worked on this chart. There you go. And we break down all of the key differences in the specs between the new M11 monochrome and the M10. So if you really want to get a good snapshot at what's different, this is a place to do it. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, right. And you can go there. Um, I, I would say the high points, though, is going to be the sensor. A um, little bit increased dynamic range. The viewfinder experience is fantastic. The battery life is longer. It has in-camera charging through USB-C. And... Yes, it has variable resolution, but no, you probably don't need to use it. It's lighter. It's lighter because it's aluminum. It's Some people like that and don't like it. Um, yeah, it's just... yeah. But check out the, the spreadsheet, check out the article and the, and the episode. Oh, it also has internal storage, which is pretty cool, yeah. too. Next question. And oh. and I would say... Okay. Here. But one, <laughs> we've, one more, this, we've, we've covered sorry, so one, much. One more link. Okay. One more link. So if you really want to see like a super, super deep dive... Oh, right, a review. Sorry. Yeah. Like, there you go. So if you look on, on Red.forum Forum under reviews, I did a very, very extensive M11 monochrome review uh, with tons of real world samples, an explanation of why monochrome and not just why monochrome, but also comparing M11 to M10 monochrome in, in detail. Uh, so I would uh, highly recommend checking that out on Red.forum Forum and I can 
drop a link to that uh, as well. But you All can right. come back here. Next question. I'm planning to get a Q2 monochrome to pair with my SO2 for travels. What small lenses do you recommend for the SO2 if you can only pick one? Well, small is relative. Mm. But, yeah. And the smaller you go, you have to make compromises, right? So <laughs> here you go. <laughs> I would say the the one of the Apple um, Summicrons, like if you have a Q2 with a 28, I'd probably bring a 50 okay, Apple yeah. uh, mm -hmm. SL. If that's still too big, the 50 non Apple SL. Mm -hmm. If that's still too big, either the 50 Apple M or the or the 50 Lux M. I mean, or I wouldn't rule out the uh, 24 to 70. The 24 to 70 is a great option. They may say that's too big. I don't know. Like I just say, oh, I don't know. Like uh, what? I mean, that's pretty light for me. You should give me a weight spec or something under so many grams. But you can go with an M lens too. Yeah, that's what that's I'm saying. What 50 saying. Apple or 50 uh, Lux SL small, or um, M. I mean. Next question. Okay. Uh, do you guys use UVs to protect your lenses? No. I, I don't. We don't because we both use creative filters. Yeah. Um, and I would have to be taking them on yeah. and putting them on. Now, I think if, I would say, I think if I never used um, or did, wasn't using a creative filter, polarizer, ND, whatever, mm -hmm. probably, but it would depend on the environment that I was in as well. I don't think it's a bad idea. The difference is that I never, we never really have to sell any of the lenses we use, so we don't have to think about the next owner. That's true. <laughs> like, I know a lot of people watching will do uh, trading and upgrading, which is fine. Um, and in that case, you're a little bit more conscious about certain aspects of condition. There's no downside to a UV filter as long as you know to take it off before you put on a Yeah, you don't filter. want filters being stacked because the light will bounce in between the glass and you'll get, hey, you know, glaring, not uh, good. Hey, mm -hmm. failing flare and other it's things. It's gross. Yes. Next. It's, gr it's gross. Let's see. What is the best setup for autofocus on the SL2S when shooting birds in flight with a 100 to 400 millimeter lens? What's the best setting for settings? autofocus? I mean, well, I don't know. Have you shot anything like that? Adam, Adam did. Adam <laughs> if only did, he was yeah. here. All right, Adam, Adam, hold on. Let me call a friend. Flight, but... <laughs> I think I shoot a lot of static subjects when yeah. it comes to nature photography. Yeah. You know, mountains don't move that much. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the tracking focus, the dynamic tracking is good. Although, let's be real, we've talked about this before. The biggest area where the SL system is lacking right now is tracking focus. It's certainly gotten a lot better since the original SL. It has indeed. But that's where Leica has the most room to improve. Yep. Um, you, you're going to have to experiment, honestly. If I was, what I would say is this. If I was going to go on a trip and I knew I was going to do a lot of bird photography, I would first just go to a local park practice. Um, and practice and sort of make a note, maybe change one setting, do a few shots, make a note of that change another setting, and then look later to see where you had the most success and kind of extrapolate that out to come up with a good user profile. Yeah. Yeah. Not a great answer to your question, but hopefully that's pointing in the right direction. Okay. Next. I love my M9 monochrome, but recently it started having corrosion issues, sent it for repair, but was told the part is no longer, uh, no longer available and was offered an upgrade. Is there any way or anywhere else to get it replaced or fixed? Well, I mean, David, you, you have an article on Red Forum about the upgrade program at least in the US. Maybe you could pull that up. Um, there are, I've heard of aftermarket companies that do some type of modification. I don't know about that. I can't speak to that. I would never send a Leica camera to anyone like that unless it was a total junker. You're out of luck, unfortunately. You can't get it repaired. The latest one? Uh, yes. No, 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 no. 2023. Um, so what, what Leica Customer Care is doing, at least in the US, I couldn't speak um, around the rest of the, uh, rest of the yep. world. Okay is if you have an M9, ME, M9 monochrome, and actually any of those cameras with the CCD that's having corrosion, you can upgrade it to a newer model. You can do that through Leica Star Miami if you want, send it to us, and then we'll just immediately send you the new one. Um, here are the options. Uh, although I think the Q2 is off that list now because it's been replaced by the Q3. Yeah. So the Q3 is not available for upgrade yet, neither is the M11 monochrome. It usually takes about 12 to 18 months after a camera is launched for it to be added to this program, which is why you don't see the Q3 or the M11 monochrome here. But this would be the best bet. If you had to have an M9 monochrome and you don't want to have one with corrosion, you got to go out and find one with a new sensor on the open market. Yep. Sorry, I kind of yeah. rambled on there. Okay. But yes, next. Okay. Can the rangefinder be upgraded to a wider version to allow using ultra-wide lenses without an EVF? No. No. There's only one version. If you, Well, we assume you're talking about the M10, M11 yeah. viewfinder. Uh, and that only comes in one magnification, which is 0. 0.73. That's it. Okay. Thinking of trading my steel rim reissue for the 35 Apple. Oh, but what are the key differences? Are they using Eclipse? No. No. Uh, those two lenses, are, two lenses are so incredibly different that I wouldn't even know where to start. I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> you can watch our 35 Apple episode if you want some insight into what that lens can do, but... 
One lens is a design from the 1960s, and the other is cutting edge performance of maximum sharpness. So they're just, the only thing they have in common is they're both 35 millimeter. Mm -hmm. That's it. What else we got? Okay, I have a decent M lens collection and I'm fairly sloppy with how I store them. Any recommendations? Needing up. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, if if you have well, sloppy as in, in yeah. dangerous, like you're yeah. leaving them in a in a damp. Like, don't put them in your dishwasher. You know, well, I would also not put them in like a a super wet damp basement or like a super hot attic. Um, climate controlled. As long as they're kept in a climate controlled, relatively dry environment, but not too dry, because all the gaskets and fluids and stuff will dry out. Um, you should be fine. I mean, if if you have a very large collection and you're not using stuff, I would I'd recommend just like a car. It works best if you use it and yeah. make sure that everything stays lubricated and and is moving. Uh, so I mean, the, treat the lenses like you treat yourself. If you're comfortable, if the lenses are comfortable. Yeah. If you're not sedentary, the lens shouldn't be sedentary. That's it. They got to put in steps. Exactly. Yeah. Next right. question. Okay. What are the strong points and weaknesses of a Sumilux 24 millimeter? Well, what's the weakest part? <laughs> you, can't, you can't get it anymore. Well, okay, it's it's no right. It's not really manufactured anymore. Um, that lens served a really valuable purpose at the time, which was it came out with the M8. Uh, it became the equivalent of a 35 1.4 because a 35 1.4 was a 50 1.4. Like I needed to create a wider option because the first digital camera, the M8 and the M8.2, were 1.3 crop. They needed something wider. Um, and you saw that same thing with the wide angle tri LMR to give you basically a 21, 24, 28. Similarly, the 21 and 24 Sumilux were to create essentially a, you know, a 28 and a 35 Sumilux. As such, uh, they were never really optimized for full frame performance. So they tend to be a bit softer and heavily vignetted on the peripheries outside of that central zone. Some people like it. It's kind of this wide angle Noctilux look, and I've seen some really pretty uh, use of it. If you understand the limitations of the lens, which is going to be corners and edges, yeah. um, and embrace that and make it as part of what you're doing creatively, I don't see any downside to it. Um, if you're trying to find something that's gonna match up to a you know 21 Super Elmar, it's just not going to. The fun, the fun way to use the 21 or 24 Sumilux, in my experience, is put the focus distance at minimum yeah. and try just to find subjects that are at that distance, especially ones that have a lot of background behind them that yeah. just falls off. And it's quite fun to see something that wide have that much, have that much focus yeah. fall off in bokeh. Yeah. For sure. Next question, please. Okay. What's a better pairing, the 35 Apple M and 75 Noctilux or 50 Sumilux and 90 Sumilux? Well, it depends. Mm. What are you going to photograph? Mm. <laughs> if you're doing... More street stuff, 35's got good to have. If you're doing more portrait Portrait. people stuff, 50's good to have. There's no rules like that because it's just gonna depend on what you wanna photograph and what your budget is. Those are both fantastic combos. What you wanna bring with you, I I can't answer that definitively. Personally, for me, I'd do 35 and 75. Yeah, 35 Apo is amazing. Hard to beat. 75 75 Noclux is mind blowing. Everyone knows it's one of my favorite lenses. But I, I, it just depends on what I'm going to shoot. I mean, I don't, I know. I know what people like to ask us questions where they feel like there could be like, this is the way to go, but... Didn't we do a this or that episode? Yeah, we did. But yeah. because, no, we did it depends. I don't think we did oh, this or that, right? But yeah. the reality is that because photography is such a subjective, creative, amorphous concept, it's hard to say anything is the way to do it because everyone's going to have their own approach. It's all we... Okay. <laughs> Next. Is there anywhere online to find PDFs of old catalogs or product brochures? Yes. I, yes. 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 Or LSI yep. does that? LSI has a um, an archive database. Is if it you're online? Mem- I think if you're a member, yeah. Hmm. Supposedly. Maybe. We'll get back to you on that. Uh, but I'm not, yeah. I mean, you could go to my office and a bunch of cool stuff in there, but actually you're not allowed I'm, in there. I'm, but. Pretty, I'm pretty sure, though, they, they had a project where they scanned. Did they actually do it, though? They talked about doing it. We'll find out. Okay. And then we'll talk about it some, in 10 more episodes. <laughs> Next ask with anything. It's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of really cool like, stuff. Like a Society International. Yes, Check it out. yeah. They, well, they're an amazing organization regardless of that. Um, that's who's hosting the event. Or who's, um, not hosting, but running the event in Vetslar in October. So. Like is hosting. Like is hosting LSI. It's an LSI event at the Leica Factory. There you go. Yeah. Super cool. All right. Have Next. you ever done flash studio work with the Leica? Uh, mainly when it comes to using the 120 millimeter CS lens. That's I have. System. David has, yeah. I have, for sure. Yeah. 
Well, but that's is that that's not a question. That's, that's, I mean, well, that's that is a question, question, but it's the yes or no yeah. question. I have. Uh, yeah, the S is was interestingly uh, when it was first developed, and and Josh remembers this. Leica really thought about the S as a studio camera, mm -hmm. as a photograph, you know, mm -hmm. fashion camera, and that's even their marketing, like test marketing, where they went to Cuba and they shot these boxers and stuff with lighting. I mean, yeah, from the very beginning, this was a, a studio fashion camera. And hence, that's why the central shutter lenses, the dual shutter system. Mm -hmm. We just very quickly discovered that why would you have a weather sealed studio camera that's like the size <laughs> of an SLR? And like, yeah. so I ended up just adapting it to a landscape camera. And I think Leica was somewhat surprised that people were using it as that instead of what they intended for, which was a studio camera. Um, I, I also have an article on uh, central shutter lenses and the difference is using that with flash versus not, uh, which I can drop a link to that too. There you go. But um, yeah, they're basically, it's it's very enjoyable to use the, um, yeah. to use the, the S in studio. Yeah, while well, you're looking for that, why don't you, know, you ask a yeah, question for me, Jose. Okay. Can I use the close focus of the 50 Summicron uh, dual range with like an MP? I've heard some horror stories, but I cannot be sure. You mean MP240? It's SMP 2004. Oh, yeah. Well, the 52 account dual range, as is, meaning unmodified, can use regular focus or close focus on any analog M camera, at least any that I've tried. Maybe not like the M5 or something, but any analog M camera that I've tried or the M11, because the M11 doesn't have a traditional light meter. On the other digital M's, the lens has to be permanently modified to work properly, and to me, that's just destroying it. So I wouldn't advise doing that. But on an MP, why not? should work fine. I haven't tried it, like, recently, but it's a film camera, so. Here you go. Oh, we found the article. From 2000 and when? 2012. 2012. Throwback. A little throwback. So explaining the central shutter lens. We have been doing this for a while, just FYI. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you have a selector switch on an S, uh, FPS is not frames per second, it's focal plane shutter, and CS is central shutter. And then uh, I actually, there was some confusion, and we actually figured out the entire sequence here. Didn't we shoot it in slow-mo? No, no, we talked to the engineers. Ah, okay. Yeah. I thought we did something cool like that. Uh, so this was an example of shooting at two thousandth of a second at um, with a mechanical shutter, with a focal plane shutter. And then this is at 125th, which is what most cameras sync at. And then this is 1 500th with strobe outside, which is why you want a central shutter system. And then this is five. And this is actually before Leica came out with a thousandth of a second, because mm -hmm. this was a prototype they sent me mm -hmm. that only went to 500th. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you could do day, like day for night, day for day, you know, or just showing here, this is kind of the look that you would want. And in case somebody asks, you cannot use the CS functionality on the SL2 with the S adapter L. It, has, it only works on an S camera. Right. So anyway, the yeah. the difference is this is 125th at f8, what normal non-central shutter lenses would provide. And then that was at you know 500th at f4 with a flash. So yeah. it's just much more pleasing. And yeah. it gives you an example. The S lenses look amazing. Yeah. All right. Anyway, next question. Coming back. OK. Do you guys find yourselves using the crop focal lens on the Q3 or mostly shooting at 28 millimeters? Um, mainly a 28, but I I do like the 35 crop, especially when I'm doing close-ups. I, I like using it in conjunction with the macro mode to really hone in on subjects. And I, you know, it's not permanent. You don't have to live with it forever. You can use it as a compositional aid because you can always back off the uh, cropping in Lightroom later. Yeah. It's just metadata. It's not yeah. actually crop I never mode. use the crop modes. I just shoot 28. That's the whole point of me grabbing the yeah. Q3. Cool to have, but I'll just crop later if I need to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Need to shoot 200 millimeters with an SL2. S. Should I go for 90 to 280 or 100 to 400? Absolutely. Well, we have an entire episode <laughs> about the 100 to 400 where I compare it again to the 90 to 80 and a bunch of other stuff. He did. He did. So you should watch that to get a lot more insight into this question. But the short, short answer is... The 9280 is higher performance. Mm -hmm. The 100 400 is a third the price, less weight, mm -hmm. and goes to 400. So it depends on your budget and the expectations you have of performance and if you need to use reach beyond 280. The also the 100 400 will take the 1.4 tel extender. Yeah. The 9280 will not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you need to get out to 560, that's your only option. But if 200 is it, you got a lot of options. Yeah. 
Are you going to have a show about the Leica Photos app and how to use it? Eventually. Eventually. Yes. That's complicated for two reasons. One, because we have to keep figure up, out how to show it. Well, how to show it on a device, and also they keep updating it. So maybe, maybe what I'll do is when I'm in Germany, I'll ask them like, when are you gonna just have a final version, and then I'll do a show after that. But yeah, we will eventually do that. I promise. Show, showing it on screen is is a challenge. Yeah, we will get there. Just give us, you know, five or six years. years. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Next question. What is your favorite filter to use on the monochrome camera? Uh, I, I like orange filters. Most flexible, you know, general purpose. Um, Q2 monochrome, I, I leave an orange filter on most of the time. But I have yellow, green, and red just for, I don't know, decoration. But yeah, I mean... By and large, I'd say orange this is the majority of the time. There you go. Okay. Next. Any opinions or comments on using one of the Leica SL bodies as a second camera or backup camera for an M main camera? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I mean, an M, M adapter. <laughs> yeah, you just have an M adapter, and it basically it's a second body that can do everything. I, I think it. I, I think it would depend which M you have mm. as to what SL2 or SL2S you'd want to, uh, you know, supplement that with. Because I certainly wouldn't, you know, SL2S is is insane in low light. But if you already have an M11 monochrome, like, right. what's the point? Right, right, right. Um, you know, let's say that you have uh, an M10P, maybe you get an SL2 because it has more megapixels and you can crop more and whatever. So yeah. it, I, I think you want to find things that are complementary in terms of not having direct overlap. Um Flexibility is good. Yeah. I think, I mean, the, my problem would be that if I had as a backup, I'd probably end up using the SL2 and then we would be swapping and it would relegate the M to backup because of how powerful the SL2 is. But mm -hmm. it depends on the environment. You know, street yeah. shooting, the M is going to be king. If yeah. I'm doing more landscape, portraits, whatever, SL2. I mean, it just, but yeah, you could do it for sure. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you have an M adapter or else it's not going to do you much good. Right. What is the... Correct way to clean the sensor on a Leica SL2. Camera switch on or off? On. Yes. If you're going to come in contact with the sensor with anything, even air, this, the camera needs to be turned on so that the image stabilization isn't bouncing the sensor around. Yeah, If you, if you when the camera's off and no power is applied, it just shakes the sensor around like crazy. It won't damage it, but that's just free-floating inside. There's dampening. If you put a sensor stick in there and start moving it around, it's going to put a little undue stress on it. So if you turn the camera on with image stabilization on, it will uh, stabilize the sensor. It'll move slightly. It'll still jiggle a little bit, but that's totally yeah. fine. Yeah. All right. The first lens I got was a pre-owned Summicron 50 millimeter. How can I find out if it's a version three or four and what's the difference between them? Oh, well, we have an entire episode about that as well. Um, the version four is the version that has the same optical design continued through the version five, which is still available today. The version three, different optical design, looks totally different. It has a big, thick um, silver lens mount on it. None of them had focusing tabs. It just looks different. So we have an episode on, do we have a 50 episode? We do. We do. Yeah, we have yeah, a 50 yeah, millimeter sure. lens episode. So we cover the full range, so I would watch that. Uh, the Leica wiki page, which is run by the Leica user forum, is also a great resource where you could look at the serial number for reference. So. Both of those things combined should answer your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is the Q2 monochrome reporter a limited edition camera? Yes. They sold out super fast because what Leica did is they said, which is the reason they don't do this ever, is they said they were going to make it, but that didn't release it for like five months. You remember so, that? <laughs> yeah. So by the time it came out, we had a bajillion people that, are, that yeah. wanted it. So And they're like, when is it coming? When is it coming? So when is it, it coming? It came and went. Sorry, bud. So yes, the, the Q2 reporter was not limited production in the sense... Of, they didn't say they were going to make a fixed number. Q2 Monica Reporter was limited mm -hmm. to 350 cameras, if my memory serves, and they continue to be extremely difficult to, yeah. to find. Cool, though. Very cool. Yeah. Best looking lens to match with a black paint MP. Hmm. That would be... What do you think about the black paint 50 Lux? Uh, a black paint, well, it would depend. So yeah. for me, it's the black paint 35 Sumo Lux FLE from the 70th anniversary of Korea set that was never okay, sold in okay, the US. Okay, okay, Realistically, uh, realistically. The second choice would be probably an original black paint 50 Sumo Card Rigid from the 1960s. Oh, gosh. Then the 50 Sumo Lux <laughs> a Spheric from the MP3 set. They only made 125 of those standalone. Why don't we qualify this question? Something that people can actually get. 
Well, there's no black paint lens you could actually get right now. That's, I mean, that's, that's obtainable within the bounds of reality. None of them. That's the, that's the so <laughs> the most affordable black paint lenses are the 35 Summicron uh, version five mm -hmm. Millennium and the 50 Summilux um, Preaspheric. Yes. But those are still over a lot of them are over ten thousand dollars. So. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Yeah, it's a kind of a it's it's the, the market over the last four or five years for black paint, as everyone who watches that market knows, has just exploded. Mm -hmm. um, that stuff is beautiful and it's precious. So if you have a black paint MP and you want a black paint lens for it, what would I do? I would try to find a pre-owned two forty six monochrome your mark set. Oh, okay, it's good. Or check. an Andy Summer set mm. because they came with a black paint. 35 Supercron version six, it's actually an aluminum barrel, not mm -hmm. brass, but still black paint. Yep. You'd probably pay less for that entire set than you would for an actual brass black paint vintage lens, and you get a free camera out of it. So good. Hey, that that's good. That's my right suggestion. There. That's for, good for today. I like that. Now I'm simply handily going to drive, drive up the market for those two sets. Yes, but, you are. Uh, sorry. Yeah, the yeah the Andy Summers. Andy yes, Summers yeah, or yeah, the yeah. Mark 246 monochrome sets both came with black paint 35 Supercrons. Wow. Yeah. Nice. There you go. Next. Okay. You talked about Peter wanting a 50 millimeter non ampo lens for the SO2S as a walk around lens. How do you feel about that lens on the SO2 or potentially a future SL with an even higher megapixel sensor? Fine. Fine. I mean, we did we have a whole show about yeah, it. Yeah, we did a whole episode. You see the theme here? The theme is you people are not watching our shows, <laughs> so you're just asking questions that we've answered. Now, in depth, do I expect all of you to watch all six of the episodes no. in a row? Yes. If you've been, if you could binge a Netflix show, you could binge. The two of us. What is it, 126 hours? Oh, uh, something like That's that. That's less than a week. <laughs> Come on. You take, you, take, you take six days off of work, <laughs> and you binge watch all 163 episodes, oh, and my God. I will be your new best friend. Wow. Oh, we didn't tell them about the the barbecue three that's coming out? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I would totally go for a pink Pink leather. Don't, 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 don't encourage them. Um, did don't we answer the question? I don't even remember. Uh, watch the episode, but no, I don't think there's going to be a concern. Like a no. thinks, like a nose, unlike us, like a nose what they're doing next. Exactly. So they can factor that in to product releases that we... Right. When they, when they design lenses, historically, they know that those lenses need to have legs to be able to maintain over the course of multiple generations of digital cameras at, at this point. You know, I still remember a uh, conversation about the original S lenses, which we said are not even as high performing as the SL lenses. And the S lenses at the time were mounted on a 37 and a half megapixel S2. And me being me, I asked the question, I said, oh, well, what about future sensors, you know, and further cameras? And they said, well, you can expect the same level of performance up to 100 megapixels, and who knows how much more. Now, Leica never came out with an S with 100 megapixels. They topped out at 63, uh, but the original S lenses that came out on a 37 megapixel camera work f perfectly well on a 63 megapixel one because they've designed them with that in mind. And the SL lenses were designed for a 24 megapixel camera initially with the SL601. Now we have an SL2 at 47. and Actually, if you put it in multi-shot mode, you want to see performance, really see performance, put an SL2 in multi-shot mode, you get 187 megapixel, and you can really see what these lenses are oh, yeah. capable of. Yeah. So the answer is yes. They are yeah. will hold up just fine for future generations. It is 955, so we have to try to get through oh as, many, as many as many. Speed round, speed round. Speed round, please. Um, don't ask any questions. Basically, just don't speak and don't we'll talk to me. Yeah. yeah, don't talk to me. Okay, David, you're done for the night. All right. <laughs> Which M camera is best for someone who wants to jump into the M series? Well, the M11 is the answer to that, but if because you didn't give us a budget, but if you're looking for something that's most affordable relative to most usable, I would say an M240 because they're under three thousand dollars, still have live use, still have very usable performance. I mean, or a well-used M10 are really coming down. Yeah, first. they're coming down. They're creeping under four thousand now, so that's another option. Yeah, yeah I, that's my vote. At the, I used to say 240 forever. Yeah, but at this point, because of the way the market's gone, yeah, I would fair. say just get a really beat up. Yeah, find you know, the rough. worst M10 you could find, send, send it for a CLA, yeah. and then it's going to work perfectly. Because M10, I mean, it, it's a big step up from yeah. a 240 in terms of overall everything. So. Fair point. Okay, next. Okay, can we talk about insurance? I recently, recently no. had a burglary, and luckily, no. none of my Leicas were stolen. We don't sell or recommend, or can, I can't, I couldn't speak to a specific. Yeah. 
Sorry. Uh, thoughts on the silver lens on black body versus the monochrome look? Oh, I love that. The panda look. I, I, I went on a whole sort of tangent about oh that. Oh my gosh. Like 10 did. episodes or more ago. You so, it, yeah. He, I think he could do, he could just talk for an hour about panda. In short, I think it looks awesome. I think the biggest downside is it's not as inconspicuous as black uh, lens on a black camera. So if you're in an environment where you want to be a little more discreet, maybe don't do that. But, but I find if you put a silver lens on a black camera, immediately people just dismiss you because it's like, oh, that old, old, yeah. old yeah. whatever camera. But I think, yeah, I think silver on black, especially with a black thumbs up, or excuse me, a silver thumbs up. So it's like silver lens, black camera, silver thumbs up. And, maybe a, it's and silver, a silver soft silver release. release. Yeah. Yep. Fire. Yeah. Next. All right. If you were limited to just one Leica camera body and one lens for the rest of your life, which one would it be? <laughs> hmm. SL2, 24 to 70. Mm, SL2, 24 to 90. There we go. Next. Boring. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wait, wait. Jose, you answer it. Yeah, what, what you is your want? answer, Jose? Your, hmm? Come on, Jose. M240 with 35 lips. Oh, oh no. <laughs> yes. 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 Now you're just trolling. <laughs> that's your hot. That's your hot take. Two forty <laughs> <the night>. uh, <laughs> is better than the. No. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, uh, let's see. Now. Are you shooting any film these days? No. No. I value my sanity. <laughs> I, the funny thing is, I love film like cameras, like as objects. You do. That's I am true. obsessed with them. I will buy every single one that I can for the store and get them serviced and customize <laughs> them and make them beautiful. But I spent years in the dark room. You spent more years in the dark room. We paid our dues. We don't have to shoot film anymore. So you know what? As I like to tell everyone, I shot enough film for at least one lifetime. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I shot film the way I shoot digital now to give you some idea. Well, yeah, when your family owns a photo lab, you know. That's it. <laughs> yep. But, so. yeah, but, but yeah, David has shot a ton of film. I haven't shot as much, but I've still shot quite a lot. So we're, we're no. Yeah. Um, would it be worth upgrading from 50 Summicron version 3 to 5? Yeah. Yeah, that was an optical change, so that's a huge difference in performance. Well, the jump was, I think, was from 3 to 4, right? Well, yeah, but they're, but they're saying 3 to 5. I'm saying, but 3 to 4. Yeah, 3 to 4 was yeah. the optical change, yeah. and then and version 5 is going to be, yeah. especially you can get them new, they're 6-bit coded, you can yeah. get warranty, it has the retractable shades, more usable. And it's the last of the Mandalore designs. Yeah, the, the version 4 is going to probably require a service, mm -hmm. and it, it has the removable hood, which you either love it or hate it. But yeah, that's a worthy upgrade for sure. Version five is great. Now, if you have a version three, please trade it with me because I love those. Uh, they're kind of like underappreciated. Um, like they go for under $1,500 and I think they're fun. It's just very old vintage style looking lights. It's good though. Yeah. Okay. Do you use lens hoods with SL lenses? No. Uh, one caveat. I use a lens shade with the 90 to 280 when I'm shooting in the rain, because okay. nothing is more annoying than getting like, the raindrops. Keeps water off the But body. it's, uh, the lens shades are not large enough for the, say the 2490 or the 1635, and I'm using filters on those, and the lens shades just get in the way. Yeah. All right. Uh, what do you recommend I do at the Lights Park for one day? Have fun. Yeah, I mean, there's a factory tour, customer care tour, archive yeah. tour, museum tour, museum shop, regular shop, classic shop, the Lights Cafe, the Lights Hotel, restaurant. Plus downtown, you know, the old town of Wetzlar is beautiful, so. One day's not enough. Yeah, you gotta go for two or three days, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I guess one last question, which Leica camera was your first, uh, or your introduction to the brand? That's a good question. I think all three of us should answer that. Uh, my first first? Oof. Your introduction, so I would say not necessarily your first, but the one that gave you the inter understanding about how special Leica is. Hmm. Uh, multiples, but I mean. Pick one. The MP. Perfect. Yeah, the MP and uh, and and actually fifty cron, the version five. Yeah. That was actually my first real like a setup that got me. You know, really, where I was like, wow, now I get it. Yeah. Cool. Well, I would say for me it was the M7. Funny enough, with the fifty Sumer. <laughs> it was an RIT. <laughs> that's what the, that was a camera they had in the cage, and I. Wow. As soon as I saw the first photo from that, I was like, something something special. That's Jose. Yeah. I mean, for me it was when I started at the store, but sure. I have to say M10 just. Hmm. The look and just the feel of the camera and just the design and everything. It's just, I nice. was like, wow, what is this? Cool. It's beautiful. But what, so. I'm going to, just one more caveat. Yes. What switched me to digital, mm -hmm. like from shooting all that film, was the R9 DMR. Throwback. Mm -hmm. That was, that was my baby. Yeah. 
Cool. Ten glorious megapixels. The only camera you could just pop open the back and on the sensor and just... <laughs> you could, it was really yeah, easy to clean. I know. You showed me. Like, hey, and I cleaned it with a lens cloth. Yeah. Because they built it that way. Yeah. I mean, you know, David and I and, oh. and the rest of the team, we've all been very lucky that we've been exposed to everything. So we have had a lot of influences, a lot of cameras that have impacted us. And, yeah, for sure. You know, it's been a lot of fun. It has been. Should, should, we, should, we, should we close it out on that? I think I think we should because it's after 10. And... I don't know. Are there any of these here that... Um, I'm sure there are more. I mean, there's, they're not going to stop asking yeah, us questions coming in, but... <laughs> for as long as we show our pretty faces on the TV. So I think 10 more episodes, we'll do another one. So if you have wow. more burning questions, you can just send us an email. And yeah, they're going to call us, email I'll us. Try, I'll try to answer it. Now, I can't answer everything all the time. Um, I'm sorry. I try, but... You know. Oh, we can answer this one. Which Here, one. This is a good one to leave. What are we using right now? So okay. we talked about so this is our last question. Bookends. I heard you. Last question. I acknowledge. David, what cameras are you using now? 30 seconds. Go. Go. And go. Uh, I am using the SL2, 1635, 24 to 90, 90 to 280 for my landscape work, mm -hmm. supplemented by a Q2 monochrome because it's just so much fun. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm shooting city urban things, I would have. Either my last adventure, I used a Q3, but what I usually use is an M11 with my 18 Super LMR, 24 LMR, uh, 35 APO Simicron, 50 APO Simicron M, and some iteration of a 90 they don't make anymore. So everything, okay. Yeah. No, that's a basic <laughs> kit. Jose, what's your answer? Q3 right now. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, I'm always just trying to grab it and, and go for yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I took, I just went on vacation. Yeah. Uh, I took the, Q, uh, the Q3 with me, which was great. But for my automotive work, um, SL2 or SL2S, 9280, 75 Noctilux or 90 Sumalux, depending on my mood. And the 12 Noctilux reissue, 35 Sumalux steel rim reissue. Um, those are the, I like the vintage stuff, so. And the, fifth, the new 50 Lux too, with the close focus, I think that's a yeah. mm. you know, nice. game changer, so. Game changer. All right, David, we did it. Sign us off. We did it. Congratulations Oof. to all of you who put stuck, up with us. Yes, put up with <laughs> us. If you have any other questions, this video will be posted uh, in all its glory in the archive, uh, which you can find on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, Red Up Forum, uh, which also be sure to check out playlists. We've organized it. Uh, there is a playlist for every single you know live camera talk episode, but we also have it broken down to M and SL and lenses and whatnot. Uh, so you can find a playlist that might appeal to your particular interest. So be sure to check out all of our previous 60-some-odd-whatever episodes, and uh, you might find the answers you're looking for there. there you go. If you still have burning questions, please drop it in the comments, and we will do our best to answer those uh, after the video. Do wait till it goes into archive, not the live chat, and then we can uh, answer those questions there. If you liked the video and you found anything we said helpful remotely, please give us a thumbs up. It helps the channel. Uh, and if you're not already, please subscribe to Red Dot Forum YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell so you know when we post new content and videos like this. There we go. You can also check out red.forum.com on the web for uh, like a news, reviews, firmware in depth, technical articles, everything under the sun. Um, the website is always there and we're always updating it. And uh, that's about it. Big thanks to uh, Jose. Big thanks to Lorena, who you guys can't see, but she's hiding there in the shadows. <laughs> and uh, as always, huge thanks to Josh for his encyclopedic knowledge. And thank you to you guys for tuning in and giving us a reason to uh, be here on a Saturday night with right. you. We had a good and time. We had a great time. We'll be back next month. Well, and until then... Stay tuned. Stay tuned and... Uh, keep photographing. Keep photographing. See you guys. Right. Good night, everyone. Good night, guys.